Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening from wherever you are in the world. This is the Halligans and Half Wheels podcast brought to you by Box 1971, where we're changing the culture of the fire service, one fireman at a time. Coming to you from the Fueled by Milwaukee Tools studio here at Firehouse 71. This month's guest we will get to in just a moment, but he is a highly sought after artist. Uh, He is a great friend, and we cannot wait to delve into what he has done in life. But before we get started with that, we have to talk about the cigar that we're smoking, and I'm smoking the K by Karen Burger, Connecticut. This cigar is rated 93 in Cigar Journal. This cigar has an Ecuadorian shade-grown wrapper. It is Esteli binder and filler from Karen's farm enrolled in her factory. Absolutely phenomenal smoke. I cannot tell you how great this cigar is. If you have not smoked one, you need to get a hold of one. I'm actually pairing it tonight with a hot cocoa because it is cooler outside. With all that being said, our guest is Anthony Hicks. And I always like to say Anthony Hicks artist because it just makes me smile when I say it. Anthony and I met uh, about this time last year, and uh, we met over cigars. And Anthony is a full-time artist, and we're going to get into uh, what his life has been like. Anthony, welcome to the Halligans and Half Wheels podcast. What's up? What's up? How are you, my man? Good. How are you? Man, I'm I'm glad to see you here. You rode up in the old truck? Yeah. I didn't know what the <laughs> fuck I was getting into when I was riding up the uh, the, the the back road right here with the potholes. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's kind of my silent protest to not fix it. The neighbors are kind of shitty. Yeah, I ran into <laughs> one of them on the way up. They didn't move off the road, did they? No, no. Don't don't mind a hundred year old truck running through mud puddles. <laughs> yeah, fucking just let me run through them. You know. <laughs> Fuck and <laughs> if you haven't guessed, this podcast will be explicit as our all of our podcasts. You never know what's going to be said by whom. Good. <laughs> Good, Anthony. You are smoking the tailgate from Karen Burger. What do you think of I that? I really, really like it. Yeah, that's a Sumatran wrapper. That it, first puff had a little light, like uh, pepper to it. I really, I like light pepper. Yeah, that that strong pepper shit. I can't stand it. My palate just doesn't agree with it. But this is right up my alley right here. Have you uh, have you smoked the Habano? Yes. Yeah, I do like the Habano. Yeah, that's a pretty good stick. You ought to try it in a Lancero. Yeah, well, that changed my world. You're the man for yeah. it. I mean, <laughs> I, I only smoke the ones that you've you've got me. <laughs> um, but it only it sucks that you know that that only one comes in that that uh, that package. Oh, the blister pack. I I love those packages. They're awesome, aren't they? I I am a sampler guy. Right. I can't. I will. I will not probably ever buy boxes of cigars. I'm a sampler guy only because I just it like every day I want a different one. Right. So if I buy samplers, I you know guaranteed four or five in each sampler, and then I you know I got tons of variety in, the, in my tiny little humidor to choose from. So one of two things is going to happen: we're either going to have to convert you to boxes and get you a bigger humidor, or we're going to have to find you a good supplier for HEPA bags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, and and like like looking around like on the internet, I didn't know how many people did not make samplers like that it seems like that would be a i mean i don't know anything about the cigar business like you do but right. I, I figure that would be a giant you know, uh product right to, to, to sell but I, I maybe it's not i don't know i i can tell you it's it depends on the market hit and miss yeah so by us you know not being a golf course driven area mm-hmm. it's uh not so much but in places that are cash and carry huge huge they buy them by the by the hundred count yeah, I, everywhere I go, I look for the samplers first, and then right, like once I pile up with samplers, which is usually a small pile, then I'll go to the individuals. And I'm like, you know, because I, I I'm still, you know, even though I've been smoking for years now, I'm, I feel like I'm still on the journey to find, you know, a handful that I just absolutely can't live without. Right, and I haven't really found that yet, except in a sampler. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and variety wise, yeah, yeah. Because I, you know, like, like, all right. So when I walked in here, you're like, what, what do you want now? You want like a, you want a Sumatra, you want a Connecticut, you want, it? and I'm just like, whatever I feel like at that moment, that's that's what I do. Well, sure. I feel that way also about brands of cigars. Right. So so like uh, like yesterday, I smoke. I, I had a craving for an Oliva, just a run of the mill regular Oliva V. Right. Right. So I just I had one. They've just, got great binder and filler from what I'm hearing. 
Yeah, yeah. You hear, you hear that, Karen? <laughs> and they smoke. And, and but but another day, I will want a Perdomo or I want a something else. Sure. But I'm not a like a high end connoisseur like you because uh, I have no clue what's out uh, there. You know, is is the more you smoke, the more you learn. There's no right or wrong way to enjoy a cigar as long as you're enjoying it. Yeah. And it, and your palate, or as Karen says, palate. Yeah. Uh, if your palate is different than mine, we may not enjoy the same things. Hell, we may not enjoy the same kind of sweet tea. Yeah. I mean, that's a big debate here in the South, whether Bojangles or, you know, KFC has a better tea or the Wilson's Barbecue and or Parker's Barbecue and Wilson or, you know, who, who knows who has the best tea? I mean, I kind of do. <laughs> from a, a native north carolinian right like, oh i'm just being shitty but th- there are some that are better than the others but unfortunately i can't really drink sweet tea anymore because i'll start pissing kidney stones out of my dick you know so like but back in the day when i did drink sweet tea i would you know it's a toss-up between bojangles and and surprisingly and this place is shitty but surprisingly uh, cookout has great sweet tea. I love their milkshakes. Yeah. Love their milkshakes. Yeah. Orange push ups my go to. Is that, that your go to? That's my go to. My go to is the uh banana peanut butter milkshake. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like something my wife would get. That's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> don't get it. <laughs> You'll get hooked on that damn thing. Uh, shit, I'm already fucking fat. I don't need any more. Yeah, anything <laughs> else uh, to lead me on the path of diabetes where I'm already heading to. Diabetes. Yeah. The sugars is the what sugars. the uh, country people I call it. I got the sugars. Yeah. So you said native North Carolinian. Mm-hmm. Where did you grow up at? I was born in Moorhead Beach, Carteret County. And then I uh, we moved to uh, Raleigh. Okay. And I pretty much grew up in Wake Forest. Wake Forest. So the majority of my life was spent in Wake Forest. Okay. On uh, on Main Street. So, really? Yeah. It's a the town's really changed. It yeah. In it's changed decade, a lot. Yeah, it's even. turned into fucking Liberalville. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, everybody drives Priuses and Teslas, and you know, <laughs> and then we have the Subaru. Uh, you know, we got the Army, Subaru, Subaru Army. lesbians. <laughs> so and then, uh, but back when I was living there, it was it was kind of a. It rem- driving through Oxford right here kind of remind me of how Wake Forest used to look. Right, kind of you know, quiet. a little bit country, quiet. Some stores are ran down, so if you went right through downtown Wake Forest back in the day, it was a fucking shithole. Like like most of the most of the buildings that are now all fancy and shit, that was all dilapidated. It was. Do you think awful. that's because the college actually left town? Possibly. Yeah, well, they leave town in what, 51, 53, something like that. Something like that. And they so, actually went to Winston Salem. Yeah. And uh, I, that's probably a big, big part of it. Well, it's like Oxford used to be a lot better. Mm-hmm. And then the riots happened um, when there was, uh, there's a there's a movie out called, in a book called Blood Done Sign Thy Name. Mm-hmm. It's on Amazon. <clears throat> a guy was killed at the corner of Highway 96 yeah. and 158. And, uh, Basically, the, the people rioted and burned down the tobacco barns, and downtown was kind of vacated. It's starting to come back. But what were they rioting over? The guy getting killed. He was home on military leave. Okay. Yeah. You have to watch the movie. It's right. it's pretty uh, – it's bad. It's terrible. That's what they were rioting over. The guy got killed. He was home on military leave, and allegedly he said something. Yeah. And hit on a girl. And racial tensions were high back then, right? So they did – you know, the and the guy walked. Right, wrong, or indifferent, the guy was acquitted. He just lives yeah. about six miles up the road. Oh, she's still living. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, he's still alive. Yeah. Wow. Well, Craziness, right? Yeah, I guess everybody made it out all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that was like you, you see some of the vacant buildings downtown and then some of the vacant lots. Those used to be tobacco lots. And then when the tobacco industry moved from here to, I think, Kinston, um, mm-hmm. that was the big move and it kind of depressed the area a little bit. So, yeah, Wake Forest used to look like that. And I, I remember as a kid, you know, we like, you know, this was, you know, I was born in 83, so this was mid to late 80s. Um, you know, we, we the only grocery store we had was uh, downtown Wake Forest. And I remember me and my mom going to the grocery store, and there was only one bank down there. And I remember uh, looking in a bank parking lot, and there was like maybe 50 dudes in hoods. 
in the parking lot, and I said, "Mom, what's that?" And then she's like, "Oh, that's the that's the Ku Klux Klan." Oh my gosh! I was like, "Whoa!" I was like, I, I, "It looked pretty scary." I was a real, you know, I was really little. I didn't know right. what that was. Right. And I didn't bother to ask what it was. I just remembered that crazy fucking name she told me, the Ku, right. Ku Klux Klan. And then as I got older, I started realizing. I was like, "Fuck, that was them." Yeah. Like I didn't know that that <laughs> they were you know rocking over there, you know. But well, they're, they they still uh, they're still active in Person County. So there's a documentary again on uh, it was I think it was called Little White Knight. Mm-hmm. We watched it one night at the firehouse, but <clears throat> just south of Danville, they mm-hmm. that was their headquarters, and then they still go to the Person County Roxboro. Oh shit! Yeah, like it's it's kind of you know died out around here. I think it's more gone underground, but mm-hmm. over there they're they're you know one county away, twenty five yeah. minutes they're blowing up big yeah and i don't right wrong or indifferent it's just kind of one of those things that you just stay away from yeah it's for me i just i don't want any part of it yeah i stay away from shit like that i stay away from you know bike clubs i stay away from anything like that that's a a group of men trying to tell me what to do with my time (laughs) you know well that's interesting you say that because you're you're uh you've got some art hanging in some pretty famous locations Uh, yeah yeah you do i mean you've got you're kind of a big deal. Am I? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Jesus. so I got to tell you, my buddy, Big Ging. Um, Hopefully my wife's listening to this and you can tell her how much <laughs> of a big deal I am because she thinks I'm just a pile of shit too. <laughs> like, <laughs> like she, you, know, you got to think she washes my drawers. You know what I'm saying? So she thinks I'm just fucking, <laughs> I'm just Anthony. My, my dad, God rest his soul told me years ago for every old hot old girl at home there's some old boy at home tired of putting up with her shit yeah (laughs) (laughs) and the grass isn't always greener yeah it's like guys that jump from fire department from fire department chasing a dollar or 90 cents you're like what are you doing yeah you know so you grew up down there is is that where you graduated high school from uh well i went to wake forest high school uh, roseville high school for one year and then uh that's when wakefield high school was uh being built so i was the first class in wakefield high school along with sanderson okay sanderson had an asbestos problem and so we helped both had to share a school okay so it was uh just tons and tons of kids dropped in on this giant brand new school which is cool nothing happened everything was cool but, right um, so i graduated high school from wakefield the 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 yuppie school the rich kid <laughs> school i was a fucking broke as dude there yeah. <laughs> you remember Aaron, right? Yeah. Master Donato. Yeah. <laughs> so he was on last month and <laughs> we were talking about him. He lived on the west side of Columbus by Berea and he had to oh. be, sh- or Cleveland, and he had oh. to be shipped to the east side. And he was like kid number four that was white. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and he said it was terrible. <laughs> well, like, like when I went there, it was such a, a rich area. You know, Wakefield was just being built at that time. So, like, and this was when the hurricanes just started, like right. the hurricane uh, hockey players. So they were all lived in that area at that point. And so everybody was fucking just mega wealthy. And so I got dropped in on this school with kids driving BMWs and Mercedes. <laughs> and, and here I am, my little fucking S10, you know. And it was just, it was a, it's kind of a culture shock to me, man, because I didn't grow up like that. I grew up poor as fuck, man. Like I, I lived in my grandma's attic. Okay. And I get up for school and I would lean up on the bed and hit my head on roof and nails. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. No heat, no air conditioning in the attic. It's just, just, uh, it was a big house, but it only had like two bedrooms. My mom had one. My grandma had another. And oh, my. It was kind of a last minute situation. So it wasn't sure. really the ideal thing. But, um, yeah, we, I, I didn't grow up around that kind of shit. So when I got dropped into that high school, <laughs> it's a fucking, it was a it was a mess. Like it's a culture shock, man. Sure, because everybody dresses different. Everybody does. Yeah, and, and at that time, you know, I still thought that you know what I had going on, even though I, I didn't know I was, you know, didn't, I wasn't wealthy or anything. I I kind of thought everyone lived like me because all my friends as a child was in my same category. Right. But uh, yeah, I I got checked real quick there. I I got taught what rich was. <laughs> and you weren't it. I was not it, dude. We, <laughs> we we would go to parties in Wakefield, and uh, one kid's dad invented fix a flat, 
and had a helicopter in the backyard. It had a wine cellar. I've never seen a wine cellar before. So we'd go down there and fucking smoke some pot and shit. And, like, I was looking at wines. And, you know, I've always been an artist, so I'm looking at the fancy labels. It's like, yeah, you might want to put that down. It's like an $8,000 bottle of wine. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> and I just. $8,000 for a bottle for, of wine? For, yeah. Something you piss out. Yep. It's kind of like us and cigars. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're literally burning money. Yeah, something you just <laughs> blow out of your mouth. So, But it tastes good. It does taste good, man. And it makes you look important and feel important. Yeah. Even though I'm not any of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think that's one of the cool things about you is your humility. I think that's one of the cool things. You said you'd always been an artist. When did you discover the art bug? Uh, as, a, as a really young child. Um, we never had any money for, like, Nintendos or anything like that, so... Like a piece of paper and a pencil was my gig. And um, so I'd sit in front of the giant wooden box TVs that we had. And so I'd have to sit in front of it on the floor because when my mom or grandma said turn the channel, I had to reach up and turn the giant fucking knob, like <laughs> click, 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 to turn the fucking channel. We're old. Yeah. So I had to, I was laying down on the floor and, and I'd just be drawing all the time. That was my entertainment. Okay. So I just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And I just liked it. You got pretty good at it. I got I got decently good at it. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. Who did all the uh, uh, your your ink? Who uh, drew all that? This is Javi de Santos. He is a Brazilian guy that actually learned how to tattoo on YouTube. Shut from up. From YouTube videos, and uh, he's, in my opinion, as as well as most people's opinion, one of the best in the United States. Where's he out of? Right now he lives in Florida. He just moved to Florida maybe a year or so ago. Um, but he, when he come in, he was in North Carolina. So I got this whole sleeve done right here on my left arm in New Bern. That's where his shop was at. Okay. And then this, uh, it's almost a sleeve now. This was done in Durham. Okay. So then he worked at a tattoo shop called Ethereal Tattoo in downtown Durham. So now and, you got to go to Florida to get ink. Fuck that. No. He's going to come here. I am not going to. I love Florida. Don't get me wrong. But, man, that's a long fucking way. Yeah. And plus he comes back here. And he, I, I think he tattoos in Wilmington or or his old shop in New Bern a few times a year. So um, I'll, I'll just get him to tattoo. And he's one of my best friends. So he comes to my house. And yeah. we hang out. But I don't want to be that dude like, oh, why you're here. Can you fucking touch me up? put a $4,000 tattoo on me while you're here visiting? <laughs> So, I mean, your ink is solid. It's it, it's pretty amazing. It looks like photographs. I wish I could take credit for it, but it, it, this dude is a monster. I think probably my favorite is the Ford Motor Company on top of your hand that had to hurt. Oh, a dude! Like a son of a bitch. Let me tell you something about these hand tattoos, dude. These are <laughs> these are awful as far as pain. So when he was doing this one, like my hands were just so sweaty and wet. And I was literally, I was. You lay down like on in this chair. I was so nervous and and in so much pain. I was and sweaty. I was sliding out of his fucking chair <laughs> as he was tattooing me. And I, he had to stop and I had to scoop myself back up. And I was sliding in a fucking chair again. Like it was. I was getting so wet. Just, just it soaked. was awful. Wow. Awful. And he's a uh, he's a fairly light handed tattoo artist. But on top of the hand, I guess with so many nerves or something. You bet. It's. It fucking rough. So this side right here, I used um, that numbing shit. Okay. That didn't work for too long. And then <laughs> that, sh- that numbing shit, it- it's it's okay, but it quickly wears the fuck off. And then you're like, oh, shit. You know, now we're going, we're going to hell now. You, know? <laughs> you need to get you some volume. That's what mm. you need. <laughs> need to get your hands on some volume, knock your shit down a little well, bit. <laughs> you're the fireman. Don't you uh, carry that shit no, in your pouches or that, whatever? That's, that's the paramedics. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know. Yeah, I think they carry volume. I think they do. Jeez. No, that, I think it's first head. I don't. I can't remember. We'd have to talk to Rob. We'll talk to Rob next time because yeah. I couldn't tell you. Give me some volume for my tattoos because <laughs> I'm a pussy and I just can't. I'm getting to the age where I'm just like, oh. Just hurry up so it don't hurt as bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Problem is, I think it's a narcotic. And okay. <laughs> yeah. <I think> that's <laughs> a, you're like, okay. <laughs> I hear that, and I'm like, oh, shit, that's jail time. <laughs> for Rob. For Rob. <laughs> just, don't get it from, just don't get it from the paramedics, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. So, 
you you grew up drawing in the floor. Like, what were you drawing? Uh, I was. Uh, I still have some of my original drawings from back then. So, and the one I have on my wall is a a peg leg dude with no arms and like a Jason ski mask. Really fucked up shit. I drew very fucked up stuff. <laughs> So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and somehow they have like just big bulges on the front of their, like a big giant cock on them or something. Yeah. Not gay. I just want them to be super manly. So I drew a big fucking dick on them. You might as well, if somebody has not learned who you are or know who you are, hopefully they have gone to their browser and looked up Anthony Hicks art. Where, where did you, where did you start drawing what you draw now? I, uh, what, what, naked women and yeah. shit? Uh, that started as a kid. <laughs> In high school. On that same fucking uh, floor, way before high school. Right. Um, no, I, I've just always been fascinated, like most kids, with naked chicks. And I never, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't really have a dad growing up. Okay. Until I was maybe nine. So, uh, you just kind of imagined, you, you know, naked chicks it's not like i could find my dad's porno stash sure so i had to just like imagine the shit and obviously me imagining i'm i'm over exaggerating certain features you know giant tits giant ass you know the typical shit and uh then as you start getting older you know the internet come about and then you start finding all this pornography and then it was like all right it's cool but then i actually like laid off of it for a while because i'm like well, if I want to be like a cool artist, I can't really do the type of shit that I'm doing. This is just my puberty, like my puberty just going nuts. Right. And so I was taking my my puberty out on paper. Sure. You know, and just, you know, if if every little boy could draw really good back then, they'd be drawing the same shit. Sure. Um, <laughs> you just happen to be blessed to I be able to draw. To be pretty fucking good. And, <laughs> and uh and it actually looked like a girl, you know, right. with the right proportions. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I laid off of it for a while and just started drawing cars and stuff like that. And, you know, that's how it led to it. And then I picked back the craziness up and, um, you know, probably after art college. Okay. Where'd and, you go to school? Uh, Atlanta College of Art. Okay. In Atlanta, downtown Atlanta. And that was another culture shock. From, yeah. a, from a little country kid in a tiny town to getting dropped off in a fucking <laughs> giant <laughs> mega city. Metro. <laughs> yeah. Like it was, it was, and I didn't, I've never been there before until I got dropped off. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow. So you probably looked up at the skyscrapers like Big John looked up at New York City. I've got- never seen skyscrapers before <laughs> then, dude. It was, it was gnarly, dude. I remember. You know, in the back of my, because my parents dropped me off for art college, and I remember as soon as we turned off 85 right on Peachtree Street, it was a, it was just fucking buildings as far as you can see. It was like sure. New York. Yeah. And I was like, man, am I going to be living here? This is pretty scary. You know, it's pretty intimidating. Sure. Like giant buildings and your crackheads and shit like that on the street. I've never seen homeless people before. So you got people dragging milk crates up and down the street, homeless. And did you ever go to the Claremont Lounge? Yes, of yes, course. Sir. That's like a staple you're supposed to go to. Yes, sir. Yeah, right on Ponce de Leon <laughs> Avenue. Yeah. Tell the folks <laughs> that have never experienced the Claremont. The Claremont is a strip club for uh, retired <laughs> bitches. They're, they're, it's like retirement, like a nursing home for like strippers that are old as fuck and weird. So, so like, you go into Claremont. Claremont used to be a fucking hotel. And uh, it's the dingiest fucking place you've ever seen in your life. It looks like a hotel that closed down maybe in the 60s and just got <laughs> rejuvenated last week with no money. And uh, so you go in there, and it's like a uh, – it's it's kind of like a, a open room, and then you sit in these shitty chairs, and uh, and the strippers that walk out are these – old fucking broads with giant saggy tits <laughs> and then they'll uh they'll come up and just start crushing beer cans with their tits what yeah dude there was this one fat white chick that was like we, we had the beer cans on the table <laughs> and like that it's the damnedest thing i've ever seen in my life she come up she had this big giant tit 
and just fucking kneel down and just wham and just smash that fucking beer can flat. Right I thought it, I thought the Claremont closed permanently. I guess it's open. Oh, uh, is it? Yeah, I just oh, looked it up. Oh, dude, that place should have been closed a long time ago. Yeah, they're open uh, Monday through Wednesday, 8 p.m. to 3 a.m., and Thursday through Saturday, 3 p. to 3 a. That shit is funny as fuck. The <laughs> same old bitches are still in there. <laughs> It, it's not really a place you go in and get turned on. No. It's, it's almost like a novelty act yes. that you see on TV. So, like, ladies, if you're listening to this and, you're, and, you're, and your man goes to Claremont, you just need to laugh. Because it's just like, it's kind of like seeing midget strippers or midget wrestlers. It's yeah. like, it's oh, just a novelty God. type thing. We went midget wrestling last year. That was amazing. Where at? Uh, we drove all the way to High Point. Mm. <laughs> It was amazing. We it was bought, like one of those wrestling matches with like they brought in the the micro. They were on a bus. Oh, yeah. so it's like a legit thing. Yeah, like uh, the tallest guy. <laughs> I wish Phil was here. Uh, he was like four foot eleven, yeah. and he like towered over the rest of them. And we started chanting all of us together, "Not a midget." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you started heckling the non midget. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had so much fun. They they posed for pictures with us. It was a it was a great time. I think it's the greatest thing. I'm 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 so down for people with any kind of shit like that to do weird fucked up things like that. That's why I'm fully in support of shit like that. And right. and the old sideshow freak show things. Sure. Like where can those people get jobs at? So and and from what I hear, I watched a lot of documentaries like you, like. I watch a lot of uh, shit, like, like interviews with these people, and they're like, yeah, I really love my job, and I'm making way more than anybody else. Right. Like, And they don't have no legs and feet and all that kind of shit. And I'm like, w- that's a perfect job, and they love it. Right. Yeah, they're getting exploited, but fucking you're getting exploited too going into your fucking warehouse job. Right. You know, working for shit money an hour. So you're getting exploited too. It's what'd, just they look a little bit different. What would you think of that Oliver Anthony song? I, I I liked it. I don't think it's the greatest song the world's ever heard. It's sure not. It, it it's not going to set the world on fire as far as uh, you know uh, the song itself. But it it was written and per, and performed at the exact right time the country needed it. Yeah. So and, and it was a hundred percent right on. And uh, I mean, I loved it. I, I love the feedback it got. I love the negativity it got because it got up under the skin of the right people. Yeah. All the people that I dislike, right? <laughs> and uh, so I'm I'm down for it, man. Well, you know? there's there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So art school, what's something that sticks out about art school? Huge amount of liberals. I was the only. Uh, I hate to call myself normal because I just expose myself being a complete and utter, like uh, <laughs> you know, like a a guy who's drawing pornography pretty much. <laughs> Nudie girls. Yeah. So <laughs> when I went in there, like, dude, I'm the normal one. Really? Yeah, yeah. dude. So, like, when I went in there, uh, yeah, you got people in there painting with their girlfriend's period blood. What? Yeah. The, and it's Whoa. all, yeah, it's all trying to be different. That's all they're doing is see who can outshock each other. And, and all these artists are doing is trying to reinvent the wheel. They're like, who can be the most extreme? Who can. It's like they just want to make a name for themselves, so they're doing so much fucked up shit that, like, you know, it's, I don't know, man. What the world is wrong with people? Well, you should see this dude who did that shit. He had, he like, <laughs> he was totally bald and had these two little, like, pigtails that he used to spike up in devil horns, dude. His name was Brian, dude. He's a He was a cool dude, like, to talk to, but he fucking weird, dude. So is he still around? Oh yeah, he's still young, but and far the art, art, as far as the art world is concerned, I don't think anybody I went to art school with probably still does art. It's kind of like the, uh, you know, the people that peaked in high school. They peaked mm-hmm. too soon. Mm-hmm. You know, you talk about people driving BMWs and doing what they yeah. want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Who, who's laughing now? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, all the times we get together and hang out, you know, you don't ever tell anybody really what you do. You know, that's the cool yeah, part. Yeah. You know, you live in a very small town. Yeah. You park on Main Street, you know, and those that know you, you know, I sent my buddy a text telling him that you're on his, on your way here, and he was like, fuck you. And I'm like, <laughs> sorry. I mean, if you got two hours, start driving, you know. And yeah. He's like, you don't understand. Like, his art is amazing. And it is. I mean, it's. That's awesome, man. It's a, 
it's a, it's it's a niche, but there it's a it's a it's a pretty large niche. It's a it's a more of a it's a more of a large niche than I thought it was going to be. I thought I was really going to pigeon myself, like pigeonhole myself, right? And I was going to be just uh, just a, like like the Claremont bitch is a novelty act. Well, a novelty act ends up paying pretty good, and then growing up poor, when you automatically get some money, you start doing some Mike Tyson type shit. So I started buying fancy cars. And, uh, <laughs> you didn't buy a tiger? No, fuck that. I, uh, I got her at home on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to hear this and jerk you when you sleep. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I like to keep my life pretty much secret. You know, I, I still believe in that don't piss where you lay type thing. Sure. And I don't want everybody all up in my business. And um, I live very modestly. Uh, yeah, I live in the smallest house in Frankleton. Um, I don't, I don't do any crazy shit. I just, you can drive right past my house and you wouldn't. Well, you see all the cars, but you, you wouldn't really know that, you know, that's your place. Right, right. There's no gates and crazy yeah. shit and signs and yeah. There's nothing blaring out there that says, "Hey, I'm the fucking man." You know, that's <laughs> that's not the way I want to live. Um, I just. That the humbleness of my my childhood kind of is kept with me, right? And I get that a lot from my grandpa. My grandpa, he he did a lot of, uh, you know, he was kind of like a role model to me. So, and he was very humble like that, but um, he had a lot of fucking money that just, and you would never know, never yeah. ever know. And I always saw how cool he was. My grandpa was just the fucking coolest dude. Right. Like, and I saw how he carried himself and like, it was confident. He had money, but no one knew he had money. And it's like, you know, just fucking cool, man. And I was like, I want to be that guy. Right. And I thank God that he was in my life, man. Cause I, how many I, years did you get with him? He just died maybe seven years ago. Oh, so a good majority all, of your life. All Most of my life. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. And he was totally my role model with the cars, with everything. He was he was the guy that taught me really how to 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 build cars. Right. So that's kind of what he did. You know, he, he built everything. Cars. You are a gearhead, though. Oh, yeah, dude, for sure. Yeah, because you roll up in different vehicles all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I build every single one of those cars my, no shit. with my own hands. Yeah. Really? I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So I got a, a tiny shop at my house, and I literally build the chassis. I build the suspensions. I do all of my welding, everything. No shit. Yep. Wow. Some people are doing good just to drive their car to get their oil changed. Mm. <laughs> yeah. That's where we're at. You know, it's it's funny, you know, <clears throat> I remember when I was getting, as a young man, getting checked off to drive fire apparatus. I didn't know how many quarts of oil, how many quarts of antifreeze, or how many gallons it required. You know, all the different measurements of things. Mm -hmm. What kind of fuel filter, what kind of oil filter, air filters. And now these people, they just... It starts up. It's good to go. Yeah, it's a whole different world. Man. It's the it's the uh, the what I call the iPhone generation. So these cars and stuff now are just like these fucking phones, right? Sure. They you turn them on, you turn them off, and you use them. There's no maintenance. There's no nothing like that. That's the way these these kids treat these fucking things, and they treat their cars like that, not understanding that these are machines. They have gears. They need oil. They need maintenance. They're gonna break. Right. You know, and one person gets a new car and it breaks down, oh, their fucking life's over. <laughs> I'm like, no, you got to realize what it took, what it, what all is going on in that vehicle to get you to your, uh, you know. A to B. Yeah. Right. <laughs> they have no fucking clue. And that's that's why, like, when I build these cars, it's like I tell my wife, like, you have no clue what, like, what's going on in these things. Like, Did you let her drive the cars? I, I would love for her to drive the car. She she won't. She she doesn't like to drive. She's very proper. She's she's high end, dude. Like, she's she's top flight. She's top fucking flight. She's, she's way she's, out of my league. She's classy. How'd you meet her? Uh, I met her through some so through some family. Yeah, at a family reunion, I had a cousin that knew her, and I was like, "Ooh, who is that?" Full disclaimer: not your cousin. No, no, no. Yeah, you know how people are. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. if she was my cousin, I still wouldn't <laughs> give a fuck. Not one fuck in this guy's body right here. Buddy. To give. I don't give a shit. First, second, third, I don't give a fuck, dude. I'd smash her just like she ain't. She's that hot, dude. 
How long y'all been married? Uh, holy fuck, she's gonna kill me. What six years? Okay, something like that. Right. But we've been together maybe eleven years. Okay, something like that. She's way out of my fucking league. Yeah, you outkicked your coverage. Oh, she's super sweet. Oh, she well, dude, she's the best because she's like raised by a Baptist preacher who was old school, and he he really taught her how to treat a man. And it's not uh, like a you know, machismo type thing. She just knows how to treat a dude. Sure. The old school way that us men like. Like we like a nurturing woman. We like one that cares. Not these brand new bitches now. That that like if you're not if you're not making six figures and driving a Lambo, fuck you then. I'm like, bitch, you're a three. <laughs> like, stop. <laughs> stop that shit. And your wife's got a big girl job. She yeah, she's professional. She's yeah. like yeah, yeah. <laughs> she she needs to be on this podcast way more than I do. No nah, man, she's fucking rad. Your, your your story is interesting as shit. We've only covered the first. <laughs> we've got to maybe the first layer of this. My ogre. story is interesting to men. Yeah, and my story is uh, is fucking wild to women. Yep, but interesting to men. Yeah, but I mean that's eighty percent of the job is men, mm-hmm. right? And. Uh, I think it was 84% of our audience is male. So good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel so bad about offending a bunch of women. I don't. Here. Well, I mean, you have to worry about offending the weak men, too. Yeah. And, yeah, you the, know, that that's the cool thing about owning this whole thing yeah. is that I don't care. Like, the betas. Yeah. Let's 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 dive into it. Like, the let's betas. not let's not sit back and pussyfoot around. Let's, yeah. you know. Yeah. Let's let's get down to the nuts and the bolts of what made you you. Yeah. And it's an interesting story. Yeah. And this platform being long form conversation is phenomenal for that because yeah. it allows you to tell your story in your words and you can't mince yeah. it and chop it and I feel like I'm on Joe Rogan because you got the same mic stand <laughs> and like all this fancy shit and like I need me a Jamie in the corner. Jamie's the man on I know. Joe Rogan. Pull pull this up, Jamie. Pull, pull, <laughs> pull this, this up. up. You ever seen a bear eating a fucking tiger? <laughs> pull it up, Jamie. It's like look you got your fucking board with all your sliding dials and shit. Like you like you're a professional dude. <laughs> we're trying man we're trying you know the curtis one of our instructors made this table just for this that's this is really an 800 hundred dollar table it's really cool man <laughs> it's pretty sturdy i think you could probably lay on it and sleep on it like a cot or yeah. use it as a boat because yeah. it's it's heavy <laughs> yeah you got an impressive fucking setup man i love the uh the barn and like you got a whole you got a whole fucking museum display over there dude yeah yeah, Phil's 911 gears here, and I, I, I need to walk around after. Yeah, this. yeah, no, no, you no. Give worries. me a 10 cent tour of this fucking place. Oh yeah, wait till you see the house. Yeah, that'd yeah, be, that'd be rad. <laughs> yeah, you like? I didn't know you lived in like an old plantation house. Yeah, the house was built in 1874. Jeez, that motherfucker seen some shit. Yeah, and uh, we just got all the land that surrounds us to the west and then to the north. So damn, you're we're, rich, dude. We're clear. <laughs> no, we're not. Oh, you're rich, dude. No. <laughs> A lot of debt. Who gives a fuck? The rich people in the world are in debt. Who gives a fuck? Well, I mean, you got to leverage it. Have you seen what's going on with Grant Cardone? Have you seen, have you seen <laughs> the this? The Scientology dude? The Scientology billionaire? Yeah. yeah. Have you seen all this stuff? No, like I haven't. He, so he, uh, he in the Wolf of Wall Street, what was his name? Um, uh, Jordan. Uh, Belfort. Belfort, yeah. They went on to a podcast together and got into it. So I do remember that podcast. Right. Because they were getting into it about, I guess, well, they, obviously they were talking about finances, but I guess they were talking about who was really fucking around who. You know, I guess he was making some claims about Jordan was fucking over people or something. Right. Is that right? Right. Well, I can tell you, uh, <clears throat> years ago, a friend of mine said, hey, I've got an extra ticket. I want you to go to Aventura with me. And that's where Grant Cardone is. So I was like, well, shit, it's free. I'll go. You know, so I go to Miami, spent three days down there in a marketing workshop, mm-hmm. <clears throat> came home with a couple binders of shit that you already knew, like SEO, search engine optimization, Yeah. you know, leveraging social media. I mean, nothing was like earth shattering to right. like, you know, like yeah. I was just like, I didn't get it. And then Cardone walked in for five minutes with it with an armed guard, oh, God. and walk back out. It was the weirdest thing. Like it was completely, you know. I was just like, well, "This is weird." 
but I didn't gain any knowledge out of it. I'm glad I didn't pay for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's when I got. Do you really walk around with an like, armed guard? Yeah. Like, like somebody's after him? Yeah. Who? Yeah. You have to be, you have to go through a metal detector to get in the building every day. Who the fuck is he? I don't know. Billionaire. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling you, man. I'm, I'm That's glad. so I'm, annoying. I'm you glad know? I didn't have to pay for it. Because if I'd, if I'd had to pay thousands of dollars like these other people, I never will forget there were people from Missouri in there and they were wanting to set up a roofing business and they were there with their partners and they then invested a lot of money into this and I was like, I don't see the point in yeah. this whole fucking thing. Like, yeah. Is it one of those things where he's like, is it like a, a conference where he like boosts you up and then he's like, all right, well, if you really want to know the shit, here's a package you got to buy. Yes. That's what fucker. That's man. what it is. It's not like you go there and get answers. It's like, okay, well, if you got to come back for this, and then you got to come back for their uh, 10x deal, and then you got to come back for their growth con, and and a hundred grand later, <laughs> you still don't know what the fuck you're doing. Yeah, and then they found out that that uh, you know if you have a a 457 retirement plan or a pension, they whoop, on you, and they want to you know get you to invest in their capital. But somebody made a very interesting point on that whole deal. If you have billions, you don't need other people's money. <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. You don't need like I don't need your I don't need your capital. I'll go do my own deal. Right, right. Yeah. And the uh, I mean the interest you get on those billions is millions. Yeah. So yeah, you don't need anybody's money unless you're just so fucking just yes. money hungry that you just want to just keep piling it up. Right. Which is Exactly the reason I'm not rich because I would be that fucking shark to just pile it up. <laughs> like I'm, I'm not destined to be a multimillionaire just because I would do dumb shit. Like I would be Tyson rich. I would have the <laughs> tigers in the yard, dude. Like I'm just not. I'm not built that way. <laughs> I can just see. Hold on, it's my favorite line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that line in the Hangover. <laughs> Yeah, I would definitely be the eccentric fucking guy. Yeah, you're kind of a cross between Zach Galifianakis yeah. and Van Gogh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're kind of in the middle there. Yeah, I'm th- yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pr- I'm a, like a calm eccentric. Yeah, you got both ears. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because you wouldn't even know that you're, what you do for a living or what your interests are just by looking at you. What, like, like, what, like, what do I look like? I mean... A, a big bearded, tattooed up guy, yeah. hair slicked back. You think he's probably something like a tattoo, tattoo guy, okay. or he's probably, you know, he's probably like security for somebody important. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you just give off that vibe of, you know, there's an air of confidence. I never asked anybody that. I was just curious on what what I kind of looked like. Yeah, I I thought, <laughs> I thought at first you were a musician. Yeah, I thought you were some That's musician, cool. like, you know. And then we sat down and talked, and you're like, nah, man, this is what I do. And yeah. I was like, holy shit, this is cool as I shit. I paint chicks getting banged out on motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> well, I told you this place is named the Ponderosa. Yeah. And that is one of my favorite paintings of yours, and you said you just sold it. I sold, sold the original, yeah, but uh, like the main source of income with the art business is the prints. Okay. So I sell a shitload of prints. So if, I, if I'd known that was your favorite one, I would have brought you one. It's all right, but I, I'm going to buy one, and I'll put it up in this firehouse yeah, because this is the Ponderosa. You don't need to buy one. Dude. Nah, man. you got to support your people, man. You've done enough good for me nah. with cigars and the podcasts. And the, nah, that's, I, think, I think you've paid a few of my tabs at the fucking uh, cigar shop, too. Probably. So i got to uh, I gotta pay you back somehow. <laughs> it, it ain't no big deal. I will tell you, though, probably the first print that I ever saw of yours was Poolside. Oh, that's a good one to see first. <laughs> that is a <laughs> that that'll throw you right in the deep end. Yeah, like you are literally in the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you <laughs> tell folks your website so if they haven't looked it up, they can look it up. It's uh Anthony Hicks Art dot big cartel dot com and my Instagram is at Anthony Hicks Art. And the little bubble is uh a one of my paintings of a chick in a hotel room that just got banged out by a biker. And they're all putting their clothes back on. <laughs> oh, is that the one on the bed? Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you just smile awesome. when you say it. I, lo- I, dude, I, lo- I, I love my shit, dude. 
Like when I when I look at my paintings, I just fucking giggle every fucking time. <laughs> I do too. I'm like, I can't believe people are paying for this shit because this stuff has come out of a just a perverted mind, right? And now, like, I figured out that like this is a good recipe <laughs> that all men like really love. And, and I remember seeing these these uh you know the David Mann paintings and stuff from Easy Rider, yeah, hanging on like my my grandpa's walls and stuff like that in his shop. And I was a little kid, and I'd look up at it, and I used to be like, man, look at that fucking art, man. That is awesome with the motorcycles blasting through the wind and and the chicks topless hanging off the back of the bikes. I'm just like, I couldn't get enough of it, dude, because it felt like that feeling of looking at that was like, I'm not supposed to be looking like this. So it was a little bit scared, a little bit dangerous feeling, but <laughs> I loved it. I was attracted to it, and every time I went over there, there was like a new uh, centerfold hung up with like staples. I'm like, ooh, what's the new one? I'm not like, it's it's kind of like the feeling when you find your dad's porno stash, right? And you have that butterflies in your stomach. You're excited, and you're like, I'm not supposed to be doing this. That's why it's fun. <laughs> I want my paintings to feel like that. So when I get through the painting, I still have that feeling, and that's why I paint the subjects that I do is because I'm trying to go back to that feeling because I enjoy that shit so much. Sure. That that naughtiness, that that surprise element, the element, and right. I just love that shit, man. I, and I love, you know, when people find my stuff for the first time and they're just like, they're laughing at it because my paintings are not. I mean, they're serious paintings, but they're not to be taken seriously. They're funny. They're Boy, they're to be a, in, they're enjoyable. That's profound, right there. Yeah. Yep. They're serious paintings, not to be taken seriously. Yeah, and you don't take yourself seriously. No, dude. I'm, no, <laughs> like you. I'm were. a jackass, dude. <laughs> I'm a jackass that's that's kind of good with a paintbrush. <laughs> Paints nudie girls. Yeah, <laughs> Motor, dirty biker art. Yeah, that's what you called it. And the dirtier the painting is, the better it sells. Really, dude? Yeah. The craziest paintings I got those are the first one that sells. All my top selling prints are the dirtiest ones. Wow. And every time, like, you know, I go to shows and I set up at shows and I'll get these guys coming in like, oh, man, I love your stuff. I just wish it was clean. Okay, well, I paint a fucking clean one and they don't sell worth a shit. Right. And so I'm like, fuck this shit. And I go slam out a dirty one. And, dude. Sold out. The bottom falls out, dude. And it's just like, I'm sold out. I got to make tons and tons of prints. <laughs> There's an ashtray right next to you. Oh, God. See how stupid I am, dude? That's <laughs> no, all right. You, what do you call yourself? Degenerate? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely a degenerate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I got to talk about a few of our partners real quick that help us with training. Firedex's mantra is you take care of them, and Firedex will take care of you PFAS and PFOA free, and on average four pounds lighter than any other PPE. Matex hose, gallons per second versus BTUs. No frills, no junk marketing, just water on the fire. Milwaukee Tools. Box 1971 is proud to utilize Milwaukee tools and their pack out accessories for instructions. Milwaukee, nothing but heavy duty. Oh, I love Milwaukee shit. Yeah, we've got a ton of it, bro. Oh, my God. <laughs> Two trailers full. I love Milwaukee tools. Man. It's it, I, I've i never had an issue. Never. I'll show you some stuff that hasn't been released yet. It's pretty oh, cool. Oh, man, I'm a tool junkie. Dude. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Uh, Seek Thermal Imagers, making the unseen scene economical sleek. It has to be Seek. Crestar firefighting equipment. If you're tired of silly marketing or having to pay for overpriced equipment, look at Crestar. You know, the makers of redhead couplings. And lastly but not least, the first and only tried and true bailout system from Sterling Rope. The first, the best, the rest just imitate. <clears throat> the name to go on for rope and firefighter bailout equipment, that is Sterling. Well, Anthony, we have kind of taken up to high school and up to art college. We learned about how people painted with bodily fluids. That's interesting. Never heard that. Didn't have that on my bingo card for 23. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, when he did that and brought it into class, it had a fucking uh, a wretched smell to it. And uh, and period blood is, I guess, similar to <laughs> regular blood with chunks in it. And it turns like this brown color, like a red oxide on paper. And it fucking smelled so bad that the teacher told him how to, to go outside and clear coat it with some fucking <laughs> clear coat spray. Some poly it was spray. fucking awful, dude. The painting itself was great. He was a great artist. He just he was into that shock and all shit, man. Yeah, but it was a cool story. We're still talking about it, you know, <laughs> almost twenty years later. <laughs> right. Yeah. Fuck it. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You know, it's if somebody may be repulsed by it or, 
you know, whatever. But it, things happen in shock and all cells and sex cells. You're, you're living proof of sex selling. Yes, sex does sell because, cause, I mean, men are the dawn of time. We're attracted to the opposite sex, man. And some of us listening might be attracted to the same sex. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's your life. You whatever, live whatever you want to do, man. Yeah. It's you like <laughs> dicks in your asses, whatever, dude. Yeah. It's like what I tell people, I, you know, they ask me where I stand politically and it's hard, it's hard to get into this conversation, especially in cigar lounges. And I just, I say something like this. I believe that gays and lesbians should be able to defend their marijuana farms with fully automatic rifles. Wow. Yeah. I, you cover the whole spread, right? I there. don't care what you do. Yeah. Right. Like I don't care how you make your living as yeah. long as you pay your taxes. Yeah. You know? And that's where we should be as a society. We shouldn't be so involved in everybody else's business. That's that, right. You know, who cares? Yeah. You were talking about cars and phones. <laughs> it made me think. I looked down at my phone. Just I had a message come through. My Ford app for my truck. Yeah. <laughs> I can start my truck. I can stop my truck. I can track my truck. I can do whatever. Bragging. No, but I mean, like, <laughs> I, I just, like, I cannot believe that I never equated it like i just they said you need to in install the ford app okay you install it and it tells you when your services do and you know how much depth's left in there so you don't have to like <laughs> it's just crazy that's where we're at as a society we're lazy for those of you listening don't know that jeremy drives a badass fucking truck that costs more than my house <laughs> <laughs> no that's not a fucking rat ass truck outside <laughs> The new, the newest car. Well, my wife drives the brand new Forerunner, but the newest car I have and ever have owned is 2004. Really? Yeah. Wow. So when I see shit like yours outside, I'm like, man, you can start your truck from your phone. Yeah. I get, that might be normal now. I don't know. I think it is. But like that shit is magic to me, dude. Yeah. And it's it's it is it's witchcraft. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I'm so into old cars. Like I it just. That's my love, so I always drive older cars. But I'm impressed with the technology of new shit. I used to work with a guy who he could not explain light bulbs, so he'd just say it was magic, throw his hands up, and walk away. We'd ask him about a microwave, and he'd throw his hands up and say magic, <laughs> just magic. Hey, he had an answer and ended a conversation that quickly. <laughs> he, I love it, dude. Yeah, he was. Well, I have to tell you a story about him off the off the record. <laughs> it was pretty funny. He got jammed up pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy's off the record stories are fantastic. <laughs> I just don't want to put the man's business out there. It was bad enough when it happened. Yeah. Let's just say lawyers and, and cops were involved. It was bad. <laughs> ah, yeah, dude. I love that. <laughs> so you get done with art school. What's what's after that? Um I uh so I go straight to uh just working. Just because right after art school, you know, every every kid in college is broke as shit. Sure. So I go straight to a job, and um, that's that's what I do. I go straight to the workforce and in the art business, and didn't start this whole freelance thing until I want to say two thousand ten ish, maybe. Okay, something around there <clears throat> where I started to get interested in it. Okay, um, and I had a lot of influences. To, to go that route because I, I wanted to uh, it, there was just something missing in the art world to me because I, I'll, I'll back up and go back to my childhood for a second on the on the art thing um, that really got me inspired um, my my mom and stepdad used to take me down to um, Wilmington to the boardwalk and I used to ride BMX Flatland most of my adolescent life Okay. And so I'd go down there and ride my bicycle, and there's, you know, those airbrush shops that are down there on the boardwalk. Well, my mom we used to be on the beach, and we'd stay down there for fucking six, seven hours. And I used to ride my bike down there, and I'd go to this airbrush shop, and I'd walk in, and, and I was always fascinated by guys who did art for a living. This dude was just airbrushing T-shirts and shit, and he had some magazines over there. I just glanced glanced over there. I didn't touch anything. I, and we, me and him started talking about art. I, I don't think he took me seriously because I was a little kid. Right. And um, so he's, he's like, he's like, let me show you some badass art. I was like, yeah, I want to see it. So he handed me a juxtaposed magazine. This is from 1996. <laughs> and he handed me a juxtaposed magazine. 
and on the um so which if you don't know what that is it's a art magazine now it's the number one art selling magazine in in the world right now but back then it was just getting started and it was really really underground you couldn't hardly find it and it was uh the the founder was robert williams another fantastic fucking artist illustrator but anyway he handed me this magazine and slid it slid it over the ta- over the table and on the front of this cover of this magazine was a artist named coop c o o p you probably most people recognize him from the devil heads of like a really sharp red devil head and the guy had you know the, the yeah. hair and all he's really famous and he had a um a green naked girl riding a silver rocket through the air and that always stuck in my head and i started flipping the pages and i got that feeling that i was telling you about earlier when you saw when you get excited and you see you see something you're not supposed to see right i opened this magazine and i started seeing that shit some of the best art i've ever seen in my life from robert williams and um coop and all these you know mark Ryden and all these guys and i'm like dude that my head about fell off my fucking shoulders, dude. Right. And um, I remember that magazine my whole entire life, and I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to I wanna be like these guys. They're not super, super famous, but, I mean, now they are. But back then, they were just kind of underground artists. I wanted to be the underground artist because that was a cool thing, kind of like underground bands. Right. Your metal bands and punk bands and stuff. So fast forward to 2010-ish, 9-ish, whatever, I was like, I, then now's the time where I'm old enough where I want to, I want to continue trying to ride this path to the art shit, right? And uh, I remember that magazine. I'm like, I want to be like one of those dudes. So then I started um, the first serious, serious painting I ever did was, um, let's see, it was a, a painting called Moonshine Slide. It was just a Model A uh that was hauling liquor, sliding sideways down a dirt road, and liquor was fucking falling um, all out of the windows and shit. And uh, had an old country store in the background. It was a totally clean painting. Right. And I was like, it's cool because I haven't seen anybody to uh, to do any um, that style painting or illustration. And... Um, so I did it and I liked it and I was like, all right, this is cool. And so I started making prints and, um, I got inspired to make prints from this, uh, in downtown Wake Forest, there's a little Carolina country store and there's an old man that runs it. And I walked in there and me and my wife walked in there and he's, he sold his own prints. It's like, fuck, that's a good idea. And he's like, yeah, you should make your own prints and sell them. I was like, fuck, I, I should do that. And, um, so that's exactly what I did. And, I only had like at that time four paintings and I used to go to the hot rod shows and had my fold out fucking table and uh, I started selling the prints and they sold pretty decently. I got some good reviews and feedback and, but they were all clean too. Okay. And I was like, man, this is pretty cool, but it still doesn't have that flair to it. I, I'm still, I, I like them, but it doesn't have that. doesn't have your touch. Yeah. I felt like I was doing some, like some, um, I guess some, uh, I don't know, like some clean type shit. Like, a, you know, something like uh, Thomas Kincaid type of shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, it's not, it's not, I mean, it's my style because I love landscapes, but it needs to be better than that. And so um, a couple, I've, I've hung out with nothing but bikers because the hot rod dudes are kind of fucking lame. And the bikers are more my style. They're more raw. They're more honest. They're more, they're, they're great, great people. And so some of my biker friends was like, why don't you start uh, drawing, you know, painting motorcycles? I was like, all right, I'll, so I'll try that. And the first one I did, I was like, you know what? I, I want to do like my style. So I painted this, uh, this one, uh, it's called She Swallows Motel. And <laughs> so it's exactly what your brain's thinking it is. <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a, it looks like the Blue Swallow Motel of Highway 66, but I changed the fucking sign and put She Swallows Motel on it. And, uh, there was a dude cranking his, uh, kicking over his fucking shovel head Harley and a chick that's running out of the door, pissed, sticking the middle finger up at him, totally butt naked. Like he just like 
smashed it and he's running off. <laughs> and so I did this shit and it fucking sold like wildfire. Wow. And I was like, all right, now we're we're cooking with gas now, dude. So I, I continue to do that shit and and it just fucking snowballed. Just end over end. Just lightning in a bottle. Well, I after doing that for a year or so, I painted a, a large one that really fucking hit. And it really put my name on the map. It's called the Jade Harlot. And it was inside of a cabin, this old crusty ass cabin. Because I love cabins. I'm a country boy, right? And so it's a it's a cabin in the this you can probably tell it's probably cold outside, but the dude's repairing his Harley in the middle of the floor uh of a cabin. So he pulled his motorcycle in from outside on top of a a fancy rug. He's got the carburetor all ripped the fucking part. And there's some naked chick laying on a fucking um a a tattered up couch with like cum dripping off of her fucking ass. And if you look in the back, there's a dude and two chicks having a threesome in a back bedroom and the windows are shot out. Like it's it's a fucking rad ass painting. And and I just went balls out on it. Cause my uh, and my wife gave me the idea for the painting, so she supports. She's she's yeah she supported that shit. That was t- called the Jade Harlot. Yeah, the Jade Harlot. It's a green bike. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at it. And uh, nice fireplace. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's that. Yeah, that's that whole country cabin type shit. Yeah, but I I like I I, I like dirty like uh, and same thing with motels. I like dirty seedy little places kind of like the claremont lounge i like dirty seediness you need to paint one about the crescent off number one. Oh, <laughs> i think that would be the best horror movie hotel or motel ever dude i would love to do something with that if i had just endless amounts of money i would make a horror movie and it would be based at the crescent crescent motel been to a lot of calls there <laughs> oh please tell me some stories about it dude crazy it's just crazy man <laughs> <laughs> crazy I, people i love that place <laughs> and like every friday and saturday night i just think the fucking the people in are just so seedy and dirty and i love it dude. <laughs> doing just illicit shit. just wild <laughs> shit yeah so this moonshine slide this is actually pretty cool i mean that's that's north carolina roots yeah so it's an it's an older painting and um yeah, I, I'm I'm into that type of stuff, and I got inspired by stuff like that by an artist named Terry Redland, who does a lot of country type shit. Um, but I wanted to have some little flair to it, and uh, so yeah, it's just and and about that same time, one of my favorite movies, um, come out called Lawless. Love that movie, The Bondurant Boys. Yeah, so that kind of helped inspired that thing too. So there's a bunch of inspiration coming in on on that one painting. How'd you feel about that cop in the movie? With Which the FBI the, agent? The slick back hair. He's a fucking ass. Yeah. But but I just know that all of them were like that back then. Right. The cocky little fucking guys. In his like pinstripe suit. Yeah. 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 Do you know that dude was like uh he's like um Australian or you know majority of those actors like Australian with accents. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that until I like look at the behind the scenes thing on that on youtube and so there's there's like one movie that just makes me my blood boil this is, <laughs> i don't know why we're talking about it but the cowboys with john wayne i haven't seen that and i know you're a western guy i love westerns yeah, yeah. so that's kind of my go-to like you know that's what you yeah. grew up watching but the cowboys with john wayne there's a there's a guy in there his name's ace Ots, and he uh i think that was his name i can't remember anyways he he beats up John Wayne. And as a kid, <laughs> that pissed me off. Yeah. <laughs> like this is my whooped your role model's ass. Yeah. Dude. Like if I saw that guy on the street, I'd probably cuss him. Yeah, that's like seeing your dad get his ass whooped <laughs> in your front yard or something, dude. Yeah, it's like fuck, that's my hero getting his ass yeah, beat. Yeah, that's this is unacceptable. And then yeah, because then, then you have the fear of not looking at him again the same with the same fucking uh feeling, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That sucks, dude. I don't I don't know why that just came out. Uh uh, his name was Bruce Dern, and he played the he played the character uh, Long Hair. Yeah. He had just gotten out of prison or jail, and yeah. he lied to John Wayne. And golly, it made me mad. I bet, dude. I, I, I can watch that movie today, 
And I'm just like, like how you feel about like that, you know, like how that feeling you get, like giddiness, I get that instant anger. Yeah. (laughs) Like ready to whip somebody's ass. I mean, this guy's probably, I don't know, he's probably, uh, the internet says he is 87 years old. Mm. (laughs) I still haven't forgiven him. (laughs) I wonder how many people's cussed him out over that shit. You know, that'd be an interesting fact. If we had a Jamie to look that up, that'd be. (laughs) Yeah. How many people has harassed you over, you know, 60 some years over that fucking film? Like, man, I've had death threats and everything. There was world champion cowboys in that. Clay O'Brien Cooper was in that movie. He be ended up being a champion team roper. That's fucking cool, man. Yeah. Westerns are awesome, dude. I, I love old westerns. They just, I don't know. My favorite all-time western is probably the Ranger, the Cook, the Hole in the Sky. Sam Elliott movie. I haven't seen a lot of westerns. I've seen your token John Wayne westerns. Right. But I haven't seen, I haven't went down the rabbit hole like you. <sighs> but I, I would in a heartbeat because I love Action, Western, country. I love all that shit. Yeah, it's so pure. It just it takes you to a different place. You yeah. know, like, and it wasn't that long ago. No. It's that, crazy that's when you think about That's what people don't th- understand. It, it's, it's only like a couple of people ago. Yeah. Like, think about it. That's right. That's like your, your grandfather's father era. That's only a couple of people ago. Yeah, it's not very long. And, and to think of how far we've come as a society, computers are only two people ago. Yeah. I mean, I remember the world without computers. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, I didn't get my first computer until uh, I was 15. My grandpa gave it to me. Yeah. And the first thing you go on is porn, dude. <laughs> and then you had to fucking wait till it was like, tick, 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 tick. The page would, you, know, you hit a picture, like I want to blow it up, and it'd take like oh, five like- minutes to fucking, just to see a tit. I'm like, come on. <laughs> it's my gotta sh- be better. My shit's gonna get soft, dude. Like, <laughs> Fiber optics. Come on, dude. <laughs> Fiber optics. I'm going to go limp before I even get to see this left tit, dude. <laughs> you know. We, it's a different world growing up. Yeah. It, it definitely is. So you've stayed pretty local. You haven't, I mean, you went away and you still came back. Yeah, yeah. For some reason, you just come back, and I think a lot has to do with, you know, my family. My family's North Carolinians. And in Atlanta, there really was nothing there for me. Um, you know, I had a. I had a metal band there and you know that that was really the most important thing there like i graduated college um it was in a metal band and played a bunch of shows with some of my heroes and um toured some and and that's about it man um it's pretty cool because i found uh this week i actually found some i was on youtube and just scrolling through some old ozfest shit and i found my band when we were on MTV, the Ozfest, uh, fucking thing they did in two thousand four, and uh, I was like, "Fuck! Look how skinny I was by then." <laughs> now you're an old married yeah, man. Yeah, a little fucking married fat dude with a hot <laughs> wife. Some cool fucking cars. Could, could you imagine trying to date in twenty twenty three? Could you imagine that? Oh God, dude! <laughs> like all the the fucking they them's out there and all that like you have to weed through them like all the purple headed fat bitches or like you know social justice warriors and they're like oh god I just want a old school chick you know right and then and then like I couldn't imagine having to get on like a dating website oh could you imagine that like what the fuck would I say like in, 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 in paint, like your yeah I paint dirty biker art yeah and I'm I, a degenerate yeah yeah I'm a degenerate <laughs> fucking artist that that like you know, I'm, and those are your words. I'm not putting. Yeah. I just find it funny when you tell me that. Yeah, it makes dude. me smile every it's time. It's true, man. I mean, it, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. I'm not gonna fucking boast about myself. I mean, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> they ever make a documentary about me? I, like, I don't want them to exaggerate it and make it sound like I'm some fucking glorious person, dude. I'm if not. they were, if they were to make a movie about you, yeah, who would play you? Holy. fuck. Fuck. Oh, that's a good question. Who would play me? Obviously, for my own ego's sake, you'd want a handsome dude. So it'd have to be like a... Fuck, I don't know. Like, if Shia LaBeouf could gain some fucking weight, <laughs> you know... Could he, grow, could he grow a beard like that? I mean, that thing's pretty majestic. I don't know, dude. He'd have to probably tape on a fake one. Yeah, he doesn't have a protein excess. He'd so. have to gain like 100 pounds... And like put a beard on because he's got to be a rat ass actor to to get my 
ridiculous speech patterns down and the crazy shit that I right. say. So it, so it couldn't be some like amateur fucking dude <laughs> coming out of New York fucking Broadway school. Couldn't be coming from UNC theater. Yeah, no fucking thespian <laughs> fucking dude. You know, he's gonna have to be like. He's going to have to hang out with me for a while and, and realize, like, oh, this dude is for real a piece of shit. <laughs> and I want him to capture that, you know, the half stuttering, the half the way I talk because I'm a, I'm a natural stutterer. And um, he's got to get the cadence down. Yeah. So. Well, they, uh, who was that? Daniel Day Lewis? That was a bad motherfucker, dude. He did that, what, method acting or whatever yeah, it's called? Dude. Yeah, he'd have, yeah, I want a method actor. I, <laughs> I, I want somebody around me to, like, act like me for, like, a year. <laughs> <laughs> so just running around with a duplicate me and just terrorizing fucking uh, North Carolina. <laughs> Just like, going to art shows. Yeah, everything I say, every, everything's just you got double negativity coming from people. <laughs> like <laughs> that'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. That would be that would be great. So the the art shows you do, you're all over. Yeah, you're not just in. You're not you're not doing farmers markets. You're doing no. Yeah, I'm doing the big ones. Yeah. Um, yeah, I go every, you know, all my, my art's been from everywhere from New York to California, you name it, it's been there. Yeah. Um, You're in some pretty famous places. Yeah. Yeah, real famous places. Yeah. Places you we probably can't talk about here. Yes. But they're there. They're there. Yeah, that's in pretty cool. In front of the cool. people that you, you want to know, but you don't want to know. Very. And they want to come up and get a picture with you and then. Bounce. Yeah. 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 I've heard, and I don't know if this is true, so I'm, I'm kind of excited to hear this because we've never talked about it, but <clears throat> one of my buddies has actually been to a, a art show and purchased some of your stuff. Really? Yeah. So he says that uh, it's a fucking mob. Yes. No shit. Yeah. He said it's fucking crazy to, like, go to your spot or your, I guess, a booth. Yeah. And he said it is just, like, from the time that the doors open – until you're sold out or the doors close. Yes. It's pretty fucking flattering and humbling, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. That's crazy. It's pretty crazy what, like, shifting around liquid on a, on a, on a canvas will do. Like, it'll, it'll, it, I mean, every human being on earth loves art. And then when they get to meet the people that, that does the things that they love, you know, you just kind of gravitate towards them. I'm the same way. So, I mean, I can't, I can't really fault them for, you know, being attracted to that shit because I'm the same way. Like with, with hot rod builders and stuff like that, I just gravitate towards them. Like if I saw like, you know, like Jesse James, the bike builder, you know, obviously I'd gravitate towards him. Like, dude, you're like a icon, you know, you, you know, right. and I don't really see myself like that, but. Yeah, I mean, whoever told you that? It's yeah, it, it's it's like that sometimes. Yeah, he 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 said it was it's it's amazing to see. This last mm. show was fucking wild. I didn't get a chance to sit down or nothing. Couldn't have a cigar. Couldn't drink a Mountain Dew. No, dude, it was <laughs> fucking wild. But but I, I like it because you know the the way you got to look at it is is these are the people that are paying your bills, right? You know, I couldn't have any cool cars if it weren't for these people. Like they're literally paying your fucking. They're they're taking their hard earned, their their hard earned money and and giving it to you, right? So why not shake their fucking hand? Right. Spend a minute with them. Yeah, dude. I try to. I I spend a minute with every one of them. I want to know about them. I want to know why. You know, who, like who they are. Right. Not just a follower on Instagram. Or... No, dude. Like uh, obviously, I'm I'm I come from the world where I really kind of only know you from your Instagram handle. Okay. Like, so you're such and such at Instagram, but I don't know your real name, but I want to know your real name. Ah. Shake my hand. Like, okay. You're you're such and such on Instagram, but your real name's Paul. Nice to meet you, Paul. I'm Anthony. You know, I, I like that shit, man. Okay. I like to be face-to-face with people who collect my stuff and support what I do. You're helping feed my fat ass and my hot wife. Thank you. <laughs> you know? You're feeding my little fucking cat on the, on the ground, dude. So right. yeah, it's it's uh it's important to me to shake the hands of everyone who who takes the time and spends their money with me. So what's it like inside your studio? 
it's uh it's about this size so about 15 by 15 yeah, a little bit longer this way but okay. it's, it's more like a narrow type okay. thing but it, yeah it's like the same width and um it's it's styled after a um early 1900s general store so it's got a porch on the front and it's got um old signs out in the front it's got an old like 1950s um soda machine pepsi it, soda machine does it work i uh, probably probably would if you plugged it in I that's mean, awesome probably uh, i haven't tried it yet um and it's got wood just wood stacked in the front and uh old signs and uh, gas station so it looks like an old gas station and then you walk in it's got a screen door like yeah right there and yeah. turn the corner and and uh that's my table it's a table similar to, to the one that your your stuff's on right there and i got a um a table easel and uh i got a, a computer screen right here because i listen to podcasts and stuff while i'm working and then i got a 1800s um uh, the washing tables with the porcelain bowls Ooh. So I use that for the rinse my brushes out. Now, what kind of paint are you using? Latex or I use acrylic. Acrylic, yeah, by by Liquitex. Okay. So soft body acrylic by Liquitex is my main go to. Okay. And I got shitloads of brushes. So people, ask, what kind of brush you use? Anything at my hands on. Anything. Anything, dude. They're not high end brushes. I I I don't use high end brushes because I abuse the shit out of my brushes. Okay. So I have to pitch them in the trash so often. So I'm a pretty um, violent kind of painter. So a lot of, a lot of beating the paint on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, it's just acrylic, and um, I, the board that I use is uh, illustration boards, a cold press, th really thick illustration board they used to use back in the 40s and 50s, all the way up till now they're still using them. Um, and I use a lot of, uh, I, I do a lot of masking. So everything that I'm doing is considered traditional illustration. Okay. That that guys, I did not invent any of these techniques. These these were things that guys were doing way back in the forties and fifties, all the way through the sixties and everything. Okay. So I'm I'm using old school hand traditional style stuff. Wow. So I think I think and I think that's what a lot of people like too. They don't like the computer stuff. They don't like the, you know, this t techie digital shit. I'm giving them a hand produced a little brush with paint type right. artwork. So there's a guy in Cuba <clears throat> named Milton Pintor. Mm -hmm. And he'll paint. So he painted a painted a photograph of me that I had taken out at B&B Tobacconist right. in Ash Asheville. A uh, great place to get a cigar if you're in Asheville. And uh, <clears throat> they take and they take a tobacco leaf and they stretch it super thin. Mm-hmm. And then they paint on a tobacco leaf. Oh, that's cool. I never thought about that. Dude, it is beautiful. Beautiful. Man. And you got it? Yeah. I'll show you a picture of it. Yeah, it's 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 pretty freaking sweet. I like those old like folk arts type of stuff like that, too. Right. Well, this guy, I mean, he just he does amazing work. And, you know, it's kind of weird when you have to send him a MasterCard <laughs> yeah. to Cuba. And then he'll send you back a uh He'll send you back a photo from D or not a photo, but a painting from DHL. Yeah, because <laughs> you're dealing with a third world country, man. Yeah, you know, yeah, I never thought about that. I'd love to go to Cuba. You I actually started watching this um, Kirby Allison thing today while I was painting, and he just arrived in Cuba, and uh, it's really interesting. Holy fuck, that's awesome, dude. Is that not cool or what? That's cool as shit. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And that's a painting on a tobacco leaf? So the hat is tobacco? Uh-huh. Yeah. That's really cool, man. Yeah, it's pretty rad. Yeah. So he takes like a Maduro leaf. Yeah. Stretches it and then paints on it. That's fucking Because, you know, a wrapper leaf dude. is huge. Wrapper leaves are like yeah. this wide. Yeah. You know, so width of your shoulders is about a wrapper leaf after it's cured, for those that don't know. But, yeah, it's pretty uh, pretty interesting. You know, it's it's <clears throat> art's one of those things – it is in the eye of the beholder, right? It's a different world. And, you know, I, some people view obscurity and, you know, like one guy gave me his card about sculptures and I was like, I would never pay for that. You yeah. know? You know what I mean? Like, it's just not my thing. Like, yeah. you're talking tons of metal. Like, you got to yeah. have a crane to put it together. I'm like, that's not really 
for yeah. me. Yeah, like like art recently. I I say recently within like since really nineteen sixties and seventies and all through now, has really gotten away from uh, being uh, something for the masses, and uh, you know meaning only very wealthy people can afford art, which I think that's complete bullshit. Right, because you're selling your art to less than one percent of the country or the world. So really, you're doing your art a disservice, and you're doing the people that could enjoy your art a disservice. So that's why I market mainly towards the blue collar people. You know, my prints are super cheap. Everything is very affordable because I would rather, like, I would rather it go to the masses and people enjoy it than, than seeing my shit hang in New York for 50,000. So one eccentric fucking millionaire could buy it. And just to say that he has it, he doesn't even enjoy it. Just to say he has it. He puts it in a warehouse somewhere. Mo- most people who buy art, high end art like that, they buy it because other people can't. So it's a commodity. Okay. It's just a bragging thing, you know, that they re- they don't enjoy the artist. They don't really enjoy the art. Right. And they just they they buy it literally as a bragging thing or investment that that they can show their rich friends and say, "Hey, I got this, and you don't." That's crazy. That's all art. The whole art world is. So I've purposely purposely excluded myself from the art world. I go straight to middle class. So you cut the you cut the bullshit. I cut all the bullshit. I cut all the middlemen. I don't work with any galleries. Nothing. Nothing. Zero. So have you ever walked in somewhere and your stuff's on the wall? Yes. What's that feel like? Uh, it's pretty cool. And I and I still play it down. I, I, I'm not the one that goes in there, hey, that's my stuff. You know, come come give me some attention. That's my shit. Right. Like, I just like, oh, that's cool. And I just walk out with a smirk. That's it. I mean, I could, in my mind's eye, what I see is you walk into a, this is going to sound bad, a seedy little bar, corner yeah. spot, biker bar, right? Yeah. Tons of, tons of Harley sitting out front. Yeah. You walk in, everybody's in there in their cuts, right? You walk in, you see it hanging, there's pool balls clanging. Oh, yes. You walk in, you're like, ah, I'll take a Coke. And you're like, ah, oh, you don't want a beer? You're like, ah, I don't drink, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. fine, cool. So you sit down, you have your Coke. You sit there, you have conversation with people. Somebody five spots away talks about the painting. Yeah. You get up, don't say a word, and just kind of walk out. That's it. Because I've seen you do that Mm -hmm. when we've smoked cigars together yeah you're very like you're very self-aware which is fucking (laughs) to to be around someone famous is 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 different right that's because you usually like to me you're just anthony right Mm -hmm. to other people it's like holy shit you know and it so it's you're very you're very self-deprecating yeah (laughs) because i'm not any better than anybody else like if anything (laughs) if anything i'm 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 below you, because I uh, chances are like my grandpa taught me a long time ago. You never know who the fuck you're talking to. That's right. And I got I got to, I got taught that lesson when I was a little kid. My grandpa lived in a place called Climax, North Carolina. Um, you know where JR's is on the, on on 85 right there, Burlington. Yeah. So you take that JR's exit, go way down, probably another 20, 30 minutes. That's Climax, North Carolina. He lived over there. He lives on St. Rose Road as Richard Petty does. Okay. Uh, Racine Road. And um, we went to the Climax General Store when I was a kid. And I'm like, uh, we'd go there and he'd get his pack of cigarettes and his fucking Milwaukee's best. <laughs> and uh, and sometimes he was a little tipsy and I had to drive up there when I was like eight or nine years old. And <laughs> that's how I learned to drive as him. Really? You'd drive him to the store and he drank too much beer. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, we go to the uh, Climax store. And there was this guy pull up on this, like, 1982 C-10, raggedy as fuck. he come out, his big white beard, burly dude, overalls torn all the pieces. And I'd be laughing because it looked like a cartoon coming out of the truck, and the truck lift up. I'm like, Papa, that guy ain't got no money. That dude's broke. He fucking reached over there and slapped the shit out of me. He's like, boy, that motherfucker owns half of Greensboro. And he did. And that fucking checked me. You wow. never know who the fuck you're talking to. That's true. So I've carried that with me, that fucking slap and that lesson <laughs> all my fucking life. And so I've met like some, you know, when people come up to my booth or shake my hand or something. You don't know who the fuck they are. 
They could be the next fucking leading actor in whatever famous film you're going to watch next year. They could right. be, and I've met famous people come into my booth, and I've been starstruck, and I'm like, fuck, dude, like, but that's what I'm saying. You never know who the fuck you're talking to. Right. I'm I'm not better than you. If anything, I am below you because you don't know who you talk to. They they could be a fucking surgeon saving people's lives every day. Right. Who the fuck am I? I literally push fucking ink and paint around on a fucking canvas. <laughs> that's that's all I that's all I am. I'm I'm not some fucking so, you know. Right. I'm not saving the world. I'm not reinventing the wheel. I'm not Nikola Tesla. I'm not. I'm not doing. I'm I'm literally painting shit that people enjoy, right. and that's cool that I can get some fame off of it. But right, pay your bills. I pay my bills. I'm I'm not fucking better than anybody, dude. That's refreshing to hear because so many people once they achieve fame, even in the fire service, they they achieve fame within the job, and they think that people should know who they are. And <clears throat> it's very it's very sad because this, you know, none of this what's being taught today is re- is new, you know. It's kind of like what you just said. I didn't invent this. I yeah. didn't. It, this is the techniques that have been around for years, and the same procedures. We're just using them today. Some and, some people can't control their ego. Whew, whew, whew. Yeah, yeah, their ego just takes off, and it's a uh, that's the worst. Just not being raised right, dude. Like your your parents didn't teach you that, you know. My grandpa said always, you ain't shit. <laughs> He's an old school dude. Yeah, he'll tell you right off the bat, you ain't shit, son. What did, what did he say when you started painting and getting a little success? He thought it was cool. He never really, he kind of passed away before I started getting some real success. So he didn't really see it to its full potential. And um, I think he'd be proud. You know, he, he'd be proud that I'm doing something that I love. Right. And it's something that makes me happy and uh, able to support and do and do what I love off of it. He, right. He'd be cool with it because that's what he did. You know, he built hot rods and motorcycles and all that shit. But unfortunately, when I was younger, I, I kind of I, I didn't take I, t- I took it for granted what he did because I was just a young kid and I didn't I was too young to appreciate the things he was doing because I didn't understand it. And by the time I started to appreciate the things he, he he was doing, he was aging out of it. Sure. He had a pacemaker, couldn't weld. Oh, because of, you know. yeah. And so he was not able to, he wasn't doing cool shit, you know, when I was ready for him to do cool shit. Is that how you learned how to weld? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's how I wor- learned how to work on cars, too. Because I remember when I was in high school, I was still young and fucking stupid and i was like papa i want to you know i want a fucking old car like a 1950 chevy i want to build an old car and he goes there's the fucking tools oh i was like fuck you're not gonna build it for me <laughs> <laughs> he was like, nope you want an old car you fucking build it so as a kid we uh my dad got a 37 buick straight eight suicide doors mohair interior the radio great card 37 pounds yeah we took that thing from the ground up uh-huh. as a kid dad asked me before he passed you want to buy it and i was like nah because i'd never drive it i'd be scared to death to wreck it yeah <clears throat> but it was uh what a beautiful car i mean it came with all the extras i mean all the extra valves everything this it was in a barn mm-hmm uh-huh. We put it on a trailer, took it. I mean, I remember going to Chattanooga, Tennessee to Coker Tire and mm-hmm. getting white wall tires for it. I mean, I remember, like, so many trips around cars. And then my senior year, Grandpa and I rebuilt a uh, Farmall Super C from the ground mm-hmm. up. Went and got it out of a field and rebuilt it. Yeah. Yeah. See how important objects are to men? Because the object itself, look at the story you just told me about the object. Right, you have memories and a story that that object created with your dad. Yep, that's the things I you, you got. You got to look between the lines of old cars, of paint, of everything. You got to look at the stories. So that thirty-seven Ford. Sh- look at the stories it created. Right. Right. It created something in the memory. 
You know, I could take you back to, I, 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 I remember it all. It's not just a car, dude. No. It's a fucking box filled full of stories with you and your dad. Yep. That's what it is. All three of us together, you know, or me and my dad or me and my grandpa, there was a ton of stories and fortunate for those stories. You know, that's the, that's the one thing is some people that and today in today's society, there's not enough of that. Like we just talked about. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know anything about the car, you know, thank God my nieces know how to change the oil at least. Yeah. <laughs> and the car itself is not important. The car is a box of wheels filled full of stories. That's right. That's, that's true. That's true. So do you smoke when you're, when you're painting? Yes. I do. All right. Smoke my, uh, yeah, anything and everything I get my hands on. Okay. Um, I don't, like I said, I, I'm not a cigar connoisseur like you. Nah. I, I enjoy them, but I don't, uh, I don't know them to the extent where I'm a professional or a connoisseur of them. Like I'm still learning. You see that wall? I painted that wall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, look, I painted it. I get what you're saying. Yeah. It, you know, everybody, everybody says that, you know, that your levels are, you know, if you smoke a lot, you know, and you, you take the time. Some people just smoke to smoke. There's a guy, he smokes a box of cigars a day. A day? 25 a day? Yeah, that Jesus ink. Christ. Yeah. What kind of job does he have? He's retired. No shit. Yeah, he smokes Prima Del Rey, which okay. is cousin of the king. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's Altidus that makes that. It's just a mild Connecticut. Totally going to be me when I get older. <laughs> like I'm just going to be painting in my fucking old barn and just smashing fucking cigars. Just waiting to die. Ah. Ah. So, when you get the idea for a new painting, does somebody come to you and say, hey, I'd like to commission this, or do you just, is it all Anthony inspiration? I do zero commissions. Really? Zero. Um, wow. So I I everything you're getting is a hundred percent me. I, I don't like to deal with people's shit. I don't. I don't want somebody tell me what to paint, when to paint it, when it should be done, how much they're gonna pay for it, how much they're gonna haggle me off of it. Go fuck yourself. Price is the price. It, it is what it is. Like I paint what I paint. You don't like it? Don't buy it. It's, you just don't like what I hear? Turn it off. Just as simple as that. Yeah. And it, it's made my life so much more simple. Like I don't, I don't deal with nobody. I don't have my phone ringing off the hook. Hey, can you paint my fucking yellow Mustang? No. Uh, can you paint my pan head? No. Like, I paint what I paint, and uh, it just is what it is. It, it sounds a little bit egotistical, but it's more of a a way for me to keep painting enjoyable. Sounds like self preservation to me. It is self preservation. That's exactly what it is. Because if I if I loaded myself down with shit that I don't want to do for people, it would start to feel like a job. And I want to walk in there every morning and love it. And that's the only way that I can still love it. Once it starts feeling like a job, I'll quit. I'm done. I'll just go work at fucking Walmart or something. <laughs> Lowe's. Yeah, you'd be good in the paint department. It's the same fucking feeling. Right. right? And that's the that's the hard part is when you you don't ever want to lose that drive. No. And it's hard to be in a place where you're at where you're content with success. Creativity is a motherfucker, man, because it, it's a it's a feeling and, and it's a sometimes it's an uncontrollable feeling. And when you wake up and you're just not feeling it, put put it down. Put the paintbrush down, dude. Do something else. Go by the grass. I think I tinker on my cars. And there's times where I can't wait to get to my studio to paint because I'm just inspired. Really? Yeah. Still this day, all these years later, I'm like, fuck, I can't wait to get out of there and just paint this shit. Wow. Yeah. And that comes from, like, you had a great word for it, self-preservation and not doing anything that feels like work and, you know, it just is what it is, man. It, it, I love what I do, and I don't want to fall out of love with it. It's the same way with this business and teaching guys. There's a big hole in the fire service, and you've seen it with the people that we smoked at the firehouse together. You've stopped by and yeah. seen people, and you see varying levels of commitment or varying levels of capability, and it's hard to stay motivated. And sometimes the easiest class to walk away from 
is the one you know you shouldn't take, even though you want the money. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think we're at a comfortable spot where we're happy with our success, mm-hmm. and we're going to continue on that path. But we don't we don't need to overload ourselves, right? You know, we don't need to be going to Washington State and <laughs> Montana and Wyoming. Yeah, we got enough. We got enough things here to keep us busy. Yeah, you know that's the that's the balance, right? Is trying to achieve that to where you're everybody's happy. Yeah. You know, it's not just about me or Christy. It's about the other nine souls that are involved in this yeah. and what we do. And, you know, you talk about, you said something earlier about cancel. You know, it's crazy that people want to talk about cancel culture. Yeah. You know, like Elon Musk uh, and the whole Twitter deal. And, mm-hmm. you know, he told them to go fuck themselves. Good. And, you know, <clears throat> everybody's pulling their advertising and Disney lost a whole bunch of money again. And Good. It's like Budweiser all over. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not... I just don't understand. Like, people can say what they want. Mm-hmm. Let them let them say what they want. That's, that's right. we don't need echo chambers. We that's need right. to we need to hear things from people, and that's what inspires change. Is yeah. not just hearing the same thing from the same people. Because I always equate it to when I was a kid. I always feared my dad. My mom would say, "Wait till your dad gets home." <laughs> and yeah. Dad was a big boy, and his hands were like bear claws. Yeah, and I remember. You know, if he'd come home, you know, it would be like, what'd you do? I didn't do anything. The guilty party's always the loudest. Yeah. And if you're taken to Twitter or whatever, what are they calling it now? X? Yeah, X. To, yeah. to tell people that, you know, this, this, and this, and how bad this is. But yet, you're arguing with the person who owns the company on the platform that he owns. That's right. Do you know how nonsensical that is? It's wild, isn't it? <laughs> Like wild. Have we lost all bearing? And it's like you go on a public <laughs> sidewalk and telling other people that they can't walk on a public sidewalk. Like, where do you get the fucking audacity, dude? Right. Or, or somebody walking in your property and saying, hey, you know, this is my fucking house. Bitch, no. I, my name's on the deed. I do what the fuck I want to. Right. That's X. That's that's Twitter. That's all, You know, and there's the argument. There were people who say this should be a public forum. But in reality, it's private. Privately owned. Correct. That individual is the fucking president of that shit. He's the, he's the god of that shit. Right. $44 million or something is what he paid so, for it. I don't know. He paid a lot of money. That's all I know. So Hey, he's got it, dude. Did you see uh, where they shot an arrow at his new truck? Yeah, Joe Rogan <laughs> shot an arrow at it. Yeah. Oh, is that who did it? Yeah. It was on his <laughs> podcast. And, uh, yeah, they were talking about He's like, yeah, my truck's bulletproof. And Joe Rogan's like, yeah, fuck yourself. He's like, no, it's bulletproof. He's like, well, I don't have any guns here, but I got some fucking arrows. And he goes... He goes, and Elon's like, well, you want to go shoot it right now? He goes, yeah. <laughs> and they fucking paused the show, went outside, and filmed it, and shot it with a fucking a deer hunting bow, and it just barely dinged it, dude. Barely. What kind of steel is it? I don't know. Jeez, I don't know. Almighty. They say it's fast, super fast. $100,000 truck. So, did you see the new video on that bitch? So they put it up against a Porsche 911, and so they had a Porsche 911 on the racetrack, and they had... What, what, what do they call them trucks now? Oh. The, um, the Tesla truck? some Super truck? Super truck or whatever. They had that with a trailer pulling the same fucking Porsche. And the Tesla beat the fucking Porsche pulling a trailer with a Porsche on it. It's called the Cyber Truck. Cyber Truck. Have you seen that video? No. Fucking wild. <laughs> That's crazy. I think they put it out today. It's it's like... Fucking crazy. That's crazy. And it's got three motors in it. You built a you built a truck that can outrun a Porsche pulling a trailer with a Porsche on it. That's the ultimate go fuck yourself. And it's crazy how I love them, dude. I it's I you know I'm all for it. I'm all for free enterprise. Yeah. You know I say do what you want. Yeah, dude. The only thing about gun control is you probably should use both hands. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I fucking yeah, and that that's the that's the biggest. I mean, people who are anti-gun, it's so weird, dude. You're getting mad over a tool. Like, you need to be getting mad at the people behind the fucking tool. Right. The idea behind the fucking tool. Yep. And and in the fire service, we get mad at we get mad at the fire chief <clears throat> a lot. It's really not the fire chief's fault. Yeah. It's the people that are controlling the budgets that constrain the fire chief. Yeah. You know, and that's the hardest part for us is fire chief's trying to do the best he can with what he's got. Mm-hmm. And... Sure, it's his job to go lobby for more, but Jesus Christ, he's only one person, you know. And when you're dealing with the government, it's crazy. You're dealing with government, you're dealing with budgets, you're dealing with, you know, it's just like a, 
like teaching like a boss or anything like that, you're 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 a professional cat wrangler. Yeah. So so if you're a chief of fire station, let's say you got fifty firefighters and you're you got fifty cats and you're trying to control fifty fucking cats running around the firehouse. And with 50 ideas and 50 ways of doing things with 50 different personalities. And 50 sets of problems. Yeah. It's like, wh- why? Fucking, <laughs> I mean, this dude should be getting paid good. He should, like, right. he, he's got a large responsibility of trying to keep all these fucking knuckleheads happy. Yeah. It's a rough job, man. And then think about, think about the converse side, what we're smoking. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what you're smoking was grown two years ago. Yeah takes two years to make a cigar something that is just a a guilty pleasure in life right yeah (laughs) i mean you you can argue it's a rolled up pile of dead leaves i get it but there's an art to it it's everyone's a piece of art yeah you know it's like people that complain you know when their wrappers bust or they take them from humidity or temperature and the wrapper cracks or splits it's like uh, it's gonna happen my my wrapper cracks all the time you know what you do smoke through the bitch (laughs) keep digging baby yeah Keep light light that bitch up and smoke it. That's what you fucking do, dude. <laughs> you don't call the company and say, "Hey, you're fucking shit." It's the dead pile of leaves rolled up, dude. They're dry, and if you don't humidify them right, they're gonna fucking crack and bust and all that kind of shit. You can't leave cigars in the car for a week and then expect to smoke them properly. Yeah, and then call the manufacturer. <laughs> Go fuck yourself. <laughs> I hope they pick the phone up. Come on, <laughs> no English. Click. Oh, fuck yourself. Buy another one, bitch. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, we got to talk about Firehooks Unlimited. Firehooks Unlimited, don't be a fooled by intimidators. Box 1971 is an authorized trainer and distributor for Firehooks Unlimited. Firehouse Innovations Corporation supplies the best doors for forcible entry training. Over 2,700 doors use and worldwide use right now. The key to forcible entry is Firehouse Innovations Corporation. Akron Brass with flow meters, nozzles, and appliances. Akron Brass doesn't need catchy slogans. Old Pappy's Tool Lube, don't be a fool, lube your tool. The best thing you can do, is, <laughs> you like That's that? That's fucking awesome, dude. It's uh, Do you have any metal tools at the house? Uh, every one of them is metal, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'll give you some Old Pappies. It's on the can. Oh, fuck, I love that uh, name. Old Pappies, man. It's made in Chicago. It's firefighter owned. Say the slogan again. Don't be a fool, lube your tool. That's what I'm fucking talking <laughs> about. You For- fucking Pappy dudes rule, dude. <laughs> First in leather, if you want to use the Box 1971 discount code for 10% off at checkout for $50 or more on radio straps or leather goods from Mikey up there in Maryland. Rock Rooster Boots, where every step matters. Be the cock of the walk. Rock out with your cock out. Rock out with Rock Rooster. Another good one. (laughs) They are comfortable boots, too, Anthony. And last but not least, Thompson Multimedia. If you can imagine it, David Shooter Thompson can make it happen. Awards, trophies, graphics, decals, vehicle wraps, and more. Thompson Multimedia is your one-stop shop for those needs. So, are we missing anything about your life? I fucking hate talking about myself, dude. Can I ask you a question? Go for it. When, like, could you tell me when you started the whole cigar journey? What, <laughs> what got you into cigars? Because yeah, you're, t- you're a fucking expert on this shit, dude. So I talked about it last month, actually. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll gladly talk about it with you. Um, so, all the firemen wanted to, it, it was like the thing to smoke cigars. And I was the young guy, right? And so... I wanted to be like them, so I went down to the corner spot and got me some backwoods. Mm-hmm. And inside our jackets is a little pocket. I always keep a little. Well, later that night, we caught a fire, pulling ceiling, and wanted to be like the guys. So I pulled out, lit up, and a senior man came over to me and was like, hey, uh, life's too short to smoke shitty cigars, is the antithesis of the story. Great slogan. <laughs> so I've taken that and used it a lot. Mm-hmm. Um and that's why when we brought Karen Berger into the official cigar of this podcast, it was a no-brainer for us because she makes quality cigars, right? How to Vesta Lee. So the cigar journey began there for me. It actually began in Easton Mall at the Tinderbox, uh, smoking a Padron. <laughs> at the time, I think it was 20-something bucks for a cigar then. Mm-hmm. We're talking early 2000s. Yeah. So that was big money for a guy that didn't really have a job, and I had to take yeah. – the senior man to breakfast. <laughs> yeah, and you fucking, yeah, so, young man smashing a Padron. Yeah, that was my first premium cigar. Was it 1926? No, those came out way later. This was a Millennium. Okay. Yeah, but the Millennium was a... I don't even know how old you are. I'm 42. Okay. Uh, the uh, Millennium cigar was, each one was individually serial numbered. Okay. So somewhere I have that band. Somewhere. Where? I don't know. But it's somewhere here on the property. 
I've seen it. I just don't know where it's at. It's probably in the walk-in somewhere. But yeah, that's where the the journey began, and then becoming a certified tobacconist, uh, taking tests and showing proficiency. And right now, I'm working on my master tobacconist. So there's only 16 in the United States. I think I'm going to be 17 by that's fucking rad, dude. 2024. Yeah. Well, life after firefighting. I mean, I'm still going to teach, but you know, cigars is it's an honest trade. Cool, because you 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 you've had uh you've had your firefighting career, and now you're kicking in the door of another career which is cool because you're still young and you know you're you're doing your thing dude i'm glad you're you know i guess the firefighting stuff you love it too but this is kind of like your passion too and well you know still working part-time yeah uh being able to uh wet that whistle when i want because you know the body's still willing right and you know i'm not in terrible shape right so i'm able to physically do the job and convey knowledge to those that haven't got it right mm-hmm. and that's something that's fun is to watch people that have never done something the correct way yeah and they learn it and then they're like oh shit yeah you know like this whole podcast <clears throat> started over cigars we would all sit down after a training we'd smoke cigars people would always hang out and they were like we need to record these conversations because they're so good mm-hmm. that's where it all came from and then we were just like oh well we could talk to interesting people I mean, we talked to some interesting cats. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> literally interesting yeah. people. I mean, a guy that felt, survived a five-story fall, Jeff Cool from FDNY. He the lives in. What the fuck am I doing on here, dude? Dude, it's, it's, it's. You've had some fucking heroes and you bring a fucking <laughs> degenerate asshole on here. <laughs> no, man, you gotta have, you gotta have variety. You know, it's, you know, that's, that's the cool thing. Like it's. Hey, what do you do? I save bit, I save motherfuckers from five stories and <laughs> fell. What do you do? I paint chicks' titties for a living. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the it's, same. <laughs> no, it's it's <laughs> variety is the spice of life. Yeah. And that's one thing people always say, man, you you're, you do a lot. Well, yeah, life is short. Be busy, right? Like, don't yeah. – I could go in there and I could sit and play Xbox or, you know, do whatever, but I'd rather go do something that's meaningful and worthwhile. Yeah. You know, and having different talents and abilities and – Ventures in life is important. Yeah. You know, if you're a one trick pony, you're really no good. Yeah. You know, that's very true. You know, if you can't, just like you, you could weld, you can tune on things. Mm-hmm. Some people can't even, they wouldn't even begin to know that you need to ground to weld. Yeah. So there's a, there's yeah, a, my wife says, says shit all, she's like, is there something you can't do? So yeah, fucking math. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, I'm dyslexic. <laughs> like, it, uh, you know, I just try not to talk about my weaknesses. Right. And I exploit the shit out of things I'm, I'm good at. So it looks like I'm cooler than I really am. <laughs> yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that. There's there's nothing wrong with being who you are and doing things. Nobody lives the same life. Yeah. You know, you think about the, the, the people that have made an impact on this country. Yeah. They weren't one-trick ponies. No. You know, you think about, well, we were just talking about him, Elon Musk. Yeah. Started out, you know, what he bought? He bought some kind of car. There was only like 16 of them in the world at the yeah. time. In 99, he was a multimillionaire on a cell phone. Yeah. And now look at him. Sending rockets into space. Owning social yeah. media companies. And he owned PayPal? Owned PayPal. Yeah. Doing internet wireless. You know, yeah. people say that that's just the greatest thing since sliced bread. So, what's wrong with people being busy? You know, just because your ambitions are not the same as mine doesn't mean that I'm wrong. I think the only bad part about being busy is neglecting the ones around you. I think that's the the problem that I'm that I struggle with the most is time balance. Sure. And um I spend an awful lot of time outside working on my cars and art which neglects the people around me mainly my wife. Sure. And if I if I could figure out how to balance everything, I'm not good at balance. I'm not good at portion control with food. I'm not good at balance with time. I'm not good with math. There's a lot of flaws that I have. Right. And time balance is probably my biggest Achilles heel because I don't know when to stop. Right. I don't have a governor on myself, so I'm just constantly you know, 100 miles an hour at all times. Well, I mean, we've texted at 2.30 in the morning when you've been painting. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, yeah, I, I just uh, – yeah, time back. So, 
having all being busy is awesome as long as you're not neglecting the real important things around you and i am extremely guilty of it right years ago i don't remember who said it but in your quest to make a living don't forget to live uh, i'm definitely guilty of that you go on vacations much not too much no it's just not your thing I guess it could be my thing. It's just I, like my interests and loves don't involve uh, sightseeing or traveling or, you know, going to Paris or whatever. It just, it's not even in my frame of mind. Like as a creative person, like you, you just, you're pedal to the floor on creation at all times. Right. So I'm like creating cars, I'm creating paintings and stuff like that. So, it's like a, that that's constantly what I'm thinking about is creation. And it's like uh it's kind of like drugs, right? You, you're just constantly trying to get that that fix. And creativity is exactly that way. You're trying to get that fix at all times. So you're neglecting not only the ones around you, you're also neglecting living. You're trying to go back to that kid on the pier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get the feelings back when I was a kid of that exciting rush of creativity that I saw. Right. And uh, I'm not good at time balancing. That's and tough. It is tough. And, and I will tell you, a lot of firemen struggle with that, <clears throat> first responders just as a whole, because of the schedules we work, because of everything we do. Right. You know, that you, you, have, a, you have a hard time with balance. Yeah. You know, and... I think it holds true for everybody unless you're working like a nine to five. But even then, you know, Christy, she works from home and uh, she's got her one of those big girl jobs, too. And she struggles with I struggle with, well, you're home, (laughs) you know, like you're here. Yeah. (laughs) How come you couldn't make this happen? Right. And, you know, she's she had to put it in context for me. Well, if I drove to work, if I went to town and worked, Mm -hmm. I would lose 45 minutes each way. Right. And I would lose this much time because I would come home and I'd want to do this, this, and this. And so I kind of had to adjust my thinking you right. know, from that traditional mindset of we should we should do this, we should do that. So it's all an adjustment. That's the that's the one thing is being able to be fluid. Yeah. And your wife is pretty pretty decent with being fluid. Uh yeah, she's I get I will I I guess so. I'm not good at reading people either. But my wife is such an amazing person that even if she's not cool with it, she'll pretend she's cool with it just the sake of happiness, even if it means her not being happy because she's that good of a person. But eventually, eventually it'll crack, you know, and it has cracked where she sat down and said, hey, you know, I, I need to spend more time with you. Right. And then, uh, then that's what puts me in check. Like, oh, shit, you're totally right. It's a tough conversation. It's a tough conversation, but it's a conversation that I know needs to happen. And she's 100% right. Right. Because I'm, you know, I think as guys, we just, we're full bore to whatever we're doing. Yeah. We're we're progressive creatures. We want to progress society. We want to, we want to build, build societies. We want to keep everything moving. And, uh. It just sucks for, I guess, the women involved or your significant other involved that, you know, I don't know, man. I don't really know how to explain it because I'm not good at that part. So right. I don't really want to explain it like I know what the fuck I'm talking about because <laughs> obviously I don't. But I'm sure there's somebody listening, though, that would be that is identifying with everything that we're saying right now. Yeah. They, they, they lack that balance. They lack that yeah. ability to unplug yeah. to engage in a different manner because I I can imagine you like if you were sitting and watching a movie you'd see something and be like oh that that just makes me want to go do this absolutely yeah yeah and and I can tell you one thing that you know my wife has done like I'm a very uh I, all my creativity is based off of feeling so if I'm feeling stressed out or or sad or whatever, I don't feel like I can't produce anything. So with her entering my life, before she entered my life, I didn't paint. 
I went a giant block of time without painting because I just wasn't happy. I, my my life's weren't in my life wasn't in order, nothing like that. So when she came in my life, it was almost like she gave me the comfort of letting me do what I want to do. And I think that's what a lot of women are missing is, you know, I've stated my, my, the shit that I'm missing. Right. Right. But the, the, we, we work, I I work based off of how I'm feeling. Am I making sense? Like it's, so if I'm feeling shitty, I, I don't paint. If I feel sad, I don't paint. She's coming to my life to where my life feels balanced and I'm happy the bills are paid, everything, and I feel comfortable enough to go out there and relax and paint. So none of this really could have happened without her. Is is as weird as that is to say, like, bef- but before her, I, I I I didn't do it at all. So what was your first job like? Out of you said you painted out of college, or you went to work? What what'd you do? Yeah, I worked at a I, I just worked at an art store. Oh, okay. Well, they sell brushes and like all Michaels. that kind of stuff. Yeah, something like that. Like yeah, yeah, it was Jerry's Artorama. Okay. In Raleigh, and and I just I, I knew art and I knew how to sell the shit and I like I want to be around creative people. Okay. So and that's what I did, is uh, I did that and I was around the fucking art world, which is still shit. Like it, it's just a, it's not the group of people I want to hang out with. Sure. And I think painting the motorcycle stuff has put me in a group where I, the people that I want to be with, like all my friends are not artists. They're not. They're bike builders, or car builders, or cigar guys. They're, they're everything that that. Uh, You've got an eclectic group. I got a wild group of friends. I mean, when you told me some of the people in your in your circle, I was like, "Holy shit!" Yeah, I'm spec op community. Yeah, I'm, I'm like <laughs> I'm like the Joe Rogan of my shit. You know, like I know a lot of people from different walks of life. Right. And if I have a question about cigar i'll call you if i got a question about you know some navy seal shit i'll call another guy if i got a question about a hot rod i'll call another guy and a bike and so on and so forth so if i think if you surround yourself with the best man you're it's just gonna it's gonna help you out a lot better than surrounding yourself with a bunch of fucking dummies <laughs> you are who you're surrounding yourself with man run with dogs get fleas yeah i mean you are the sum of the five people you hang out with that's fair so that's fair. You and look the closest people, then if they're pieces of shit, guess what you are? Yeah. Run with trash, you're going to get it on you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, you know, the things that I've gotten to do <clears throat> speaking with, you know, like you, you talked about Navy SEALs. Some of the guys that I've talked with, yeah. hung out with, you're just like, I shouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, yeah. like these dudes, you know, like uh, Hugh Middleton smoked with him and uh, DC yeah, and just hung out with them. And then we exchanged numbers and, you know, yeah. back and forth and, you know, you need to come up to Patriot point and yeah. bring your guys, come on anytime, you know, yeah. and you're just like, how did this happen? Yeah. Happened in a cigar lounge. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You meet the damnedest people in a cigar lounge. It's, it's crazy. And but, those that don't understand the culture. Right. You know, it, that's why this feels like a kitchen table because mm-hmm. in the old firehouses, we could smoke at the table. Right. Everything happened here at the table. Right. Your marriage counselor was here. <laughs> your, right. your financial investment was, banker was here. Yeah. Everything was here. Yeah. Your mechanic, you know, your carpenter. Yeah. Everything was at the kitchen table, plus the meals and the ball busting. Yeah. And that's the reason we went with this feel, was because of that. You know, it's, uh, it's a different world, my man. It's a different world in 2023 than it was in 99. Yeah, damn sure is, man. And, you know, there's, there's good parts about it. You know, I'll be the first one to admit, I'll sit there and bitch and complain about, oh, this generation, this, this, you know, I'm the first one that's bitching. But if you look at it, we're living in the best time that you could ever live in. Right. As far as technology, as far as, you know, uh, medical shit, as far as everything else. I mean, that you got, you, you got all the world's information in your pocket. Right. You got, you know, you, you can talk to somebody across the world yeah. for free instantly. He, there's there's more pluses than there is minuses, but as humans, we hone in on the minuses because we still want to fix those. Right. Instead of just embracing. Yeah. Because I think that back in maybe our grandparents' ages, they probably thought they were living high on the hog. You know, they right. grew up without 
indoor plumbing, at least my yeah. grandparents did, and then, you know, the advent of plumbing. Yeah. You know, and all that comes about, and then, you know, they were living in nice houses, and, you know, things were great, the automobile and the highway right. system, and, you know, we were back-to-back World War champs, and yeah. now, you know, it's yeah. always – I think it's just a cyclical thing that we maybe aren't appreciative. Uh, and it may be a survival thing that we do because, you know, the more we talk about the negative, we usually as humans figure out a way to fix the negative. And that creates technology. That creates, you know, it, it, you, you fix the problems usually. That's how we advance a society usually is we fix it. Fucker, some fucker was tired of riding a horse. Right. Let's fucking build a car. And then put it on an assembly line. Yeah. Some fucker was tired of sawing down trees to build a house. Let's order a house from Sears and build it. Some a Have kit. you ever seen some of those houses? Yeah, dude. Those craftsman homes? Beautiful. And they're still standing. Great. So the 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 burden of man usually follows with invention. Right. So the what we're bitching about now is probably gonna be fixed in ten years. That we'll be bitching about something else. And we're going to be, you know. <laughs> it's just going to keep we, going. We've come a long way from the caves, dude. That's right. But someone bitched about that fucking cave. Right. Like, you know, fuck this rock, you know. <laughs> right. It's got to be something better. <laughs> got to be. So. Eating with eating with uh, rocks, it's, you know, cutting spears. And... Yeah, I think we got we to gotta bitch. Right. Well, we got to learn from the bitching, but we have to do something about the bitching i think it if motion without purpose is unacceptable if as long as you're bitching and you're moving forward and you have solutions yeah. then that's good if you're offering an equitable solution to the problem that's different yeah but if you're just bitching for bitching's sake then you're an asshole <laughs> yeah <laughs> F- d- do your bitching and figure it out <laughs> you're an asshole you know if you're fat figure it the fuck out that's right lose some weight that's right if you're not happy with yourself and if you suck at painting get better right if you're not a hard working, work harder. Something I wanted to ask you about. Given the art world, I just watched a documentary. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. Bob Ross. Fuck, dude. The best, dude. Is it not terrible what happened? Yes. So, yeah, it's it's awful. And this is uh, what greed does. Um, and this is what creative people get involved in all the time is – you got your creative people and you got your business mindset people. Creative people are usually not good at business and business people are not good at being creative and they kind of need each other. Right. But what happens is, is usually the business people that, that pull the money strings, they get a little bit greedy because we all, we're all guilty of wanting more money and uh, you end up doing some weird shit to get that money, such as trying to own the name of the artist and um, completely ruining an artist's name just just so you can put it on a box and sell your your goods, and that's what's happened to Bob Ross. So I was in the airport a couple weeks ago, and there are breath mints with his name on them and his picture, and I'm like, he'd be fucking rolling in his grave right now. But I I remember as a kid, <clears throat> uh, my, my grandma loved watching Bob Ross on PBS. Yeah. And she had a basement. My grandfather fixed her up a whole paint shop down there, and she just painted and tinkered. Like, you know, nothing ever real serious. I think I have – she did one painting. I'll show it to you when we go in the house. But it just <clears> – that was her thing. Like, that was her stress relief. That was her retirement gig, right? Yeah. And so, like, I grew up watching Happy Trees and Little Squirrels. And, yeah. You know, we I remember did. that. Yeah. And then to find out the tragedy behind – him not even having his family not even having the rights to his name to yeah. do things. It's kinda like the Earnhardt thing, you know, with yeah. Carrie Earnhardt can't use his last name to sell furniture. That's right. That's crazy. It's wild. It's what greed does, dude. It's terrible. Money so, is the root of all evil. Speaking of Bob Ross, did you know that Bob Ross um has so in North Carolina at Wesleyan College for the next couple of weeks is the largest exhibit of Bob Ross paintings ever. Where's West End College at? Uh, Rocky Mount. Okay. Uh, Have you gone? No, I want to go. I'm I'm going for sure. All right. And uh, I I think you know, it's something that people need to see because you know, as as much as we want to talk about Bob Ross and people, you know, with Bob Ross, you got to understand why he is famous, right? He was a great painter. 
don't get me wrong, super awesome. But he 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 gave the artwork. Uh, he gave normal people the ability to try it, and um, he he exposed. He pulled the curtain up on art and said, no, this is not just a secret thing. Everyone can do it, and everyone can do it. And uh, art, yeah, it's a talent, but it's also a learned talent. Right. So the reason why more people aren't artists is because something happened in their childhood that just turned them away from art, whether it be they got interested in bicycles or sports or whatever. It always pulls them away from taking a pencil and making a mark. And some of us just love it that much where we just stick with it. That that was my shit. As much as I skateboarded and did BMX and the hot rods and the low riders and stuff like art was just it was my it was my love. It was what I was born to do. And every one of us every one of us, even people listening, has the ability to do exactly what Bob Ross did. And he showed the world that you can do that. That's why he's so beloved. Is because he did it in a non-egotistical way, in a simple way, and he broke it down, and he showed you how to do it. He pulled the veil up, and this everything that he's doing has been doing for thousands of years, but he was the one that put it on TV and said, "Hey, look, if you're interested in this, and if you've looked at these paintings and you're, you know, him and hawing about this shit, here's how to do it." And it, dude, he painted a full painting in 30 minutes every day. Now, that that's hard to do, but let's tell the real truth. He painted three paintings exactly identical in a day. One painting he did for the producer's sake, one painting he did as a reference, and the other painting he did in front of your eyes. He painted three of them. A day. A day. And I'm doing one painting every few months. Granted, my, my shit's a lot more detailed, but his paintings were not meant to be what my paintings are meant to be. His his was an exhibition of what you can do if you take the time and do it. So that's why he's so special. Fuck the Afro. Fuck all the squirrels and all that shit. You got you to gotta realize what he did. And then, yeah, the story behind all that shit is, is rough to hear because he was such a beloved person. Right. So I'm definitely going to that show. Um, I think it's a traveling show, so I'm not sure if it'll ever come back again. But I mean, it's uh, only 15 bucks to go, and it's an hour's drive. Yeah, uh, you, you got to go if if you if you're e- even remotely interested, or even if you just want to bring back some childhood memories. Right. Just fucking go. Like they say, you can't even purchase any of his originals because somebody, somebody owns them. So they're all sitting in a warehouse in Virginia. Wow. Uh, every single one of them. So if he if those paintings ever went to market, m- tens of millions of dollars, without Just a doubt, would blow up. It will blow up. But the fact and the reason why they're blowing up is because you can't get your hands on them. Human beings love things that they can't get. Rare air. Yeah. Just like the Cuban cigar. Right. Everybody wants them because they can't get them, and they like to brag about that they have it. And then you break it to them that it's not real. That's right. <laughs> or or you smoke one, you're like, ugh. Yeah. This kind of sucks. Yeah. I want to go to my old Romeo and Julieta. This is, you know. <laughs> just give me that. Just give me something from General. This is terrible. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, I, I'm a I'm a little bit of a snob when it comes to that, you know. And the tobacco's gone downhill over the years, but the soil's overworked. That's what happens, you know. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I, I mean, I've watched, like, the Davidoff documentaries and all that stuff. And, you know, what they've done with it is special with cigars, and I'm not a an expert at all, but. I'm extremely interested in it, and uh, I want to know more about it, and I love smoking them. Same. And uh, I just love tasting the flavors of different ones, and, and, and I'm, a lot of them to me taste the same. And um, every now and then I'll, I'll, it'll peak something a little bit different, but, you know, I've smoked some pretty high-end ones, and I've smoked some dog shit ones, and um, sometimes I can't tell the difference. What did you think of that cigar you smoked today? I loved it because it was, to me, it was mild. Right. And it, I just, I'm not a fan of pepper, man. I'm not a, I've told you that right. before. And it, Karen Burgers really, I, I, I love, I love, I love their stuff. Everything that you've, you've given me of Karen Burgers is top flight. Um, and, it, but I've had, a, I've had a lot of top flight shit. 
That's less than an eight dollar cigar in the marketplace. Yeah, that's. I mean, it's shocking. <laughs> it's shocking. Because um, I've had some. I've had some thirty dollar ones that are way worse. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And it's just like, and I hate that feeling when like you spend thirty dollars on a stick and you're like, fuck. I feel like you had that feeling when you got ripped off. Right. It's like when you go to a restaurant and you 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 get shitty food and you got to pay fifty bucks for it. And you're like, fuck. Right. But I'll pay good money for good shit. That's right. I get pissed off when I pay good money for shit. That's right. So, and Karen Burgers, her stuff's never let me down. And I'm not a spokesman for them. You know, because there's tons of, ton, tons of cigars I like. It's just, it's hard for people to be consistent. Right. Consistency is the key and success to everything, man. And if you can just nail it all the time, then you got a winning, a winning brand, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, the last week of January, <clears throat> well, we'll all be down at Puro Sabor, which is the Nicaraguan Cigar Festival. I would highly encourage you to go. And where is this at? It's in Nic- Esteli, Nicaragua. It's uh, it's not a, it's not an expensive flight. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's my ticket. I think was seventy seven dollars to Miami, and then two hundred dollars round trip to Managua. Wow. Yeah. So, it's not bad, but. It's a cigar festival. You actually get to go to factories, and, like, Karen's going to host a lunch at the factory, and people get to hang out with Karen and see Karen and see the factory and see the torcedores and see the oxen in the fields. And Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, she's got virgin land. That's yeah. something that's unheard of. Mm-hmm. Right? Cause, so Because cigars, you got to – now, is it true that with cigars, you got to the, – the land around the volcanoes is the prime shit, right? Yep. yep. And so to get virgin land around that area is fucking real rare, right? Yeah, her husband, her husband, God rest his soul, Kiki, bought the land. It took him two years to clear what's there. And she still has virgin land to turn. And on the other side of the mountains from them is Nestor Placencia. Yeah, Placencia's a big name. Oh, yeah. And then next door, literally across the fence, is A.J. Fernandez, another big name. One of the big names, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> whales, bud. So, I mean, you're getting pretty much the same soil. Yeah. So... I mean, really, I guess you're paying for name. You're getting, for, you're paying for advertisement. Um, well, it's kind of like you can buy something on Wayfair, yeah, and and it is the same thing that you'd buy at Walmart, right? But people just buy at Walmart. Yeah, you know, you can buy on the Amazon Prime too. Yeah, you know, it's one of those deals. Well, buddy, we've been at this over a little over two hours. Really? Yeah, doesn't feel like it, does it? No. Well, listen, I think it's, uh, I think we've hit. A lot of good highlights. We've had some good conversation. I didn't if, make an ass of myself. I that was see. pretty good. Yeah, I think you did all right. Not bad at all for a bearded up tattooed artist. Yeah. Well, I appreciate <laughs> you letting me come on here, man. So no, it's an honor to be able to speak to people, man. I just love, I love talking about the shit that I love. That's right. Same here, and that's why I think having you talk about something completely nothing to do with the fire service, yeah. nothing to do with cigars, nothing to do. People want to hear that stuff. Yeah. You know, they want to hear the ins and the outs. They want to know. And there's nothing wrong with having conversation with people that have different opinions, different experiences in life, mm-hmm. because variety is the spice of life. So, I Anthony, I want to say thank you. Tell everybody where they can uh, come find your stuff one more time. Yeah, it's uh, anthonyhicksart.bigcartel.com. And on Instagram, it's uh, Anthony Hicks Art. So I'm not all over the uh, internet as far as uh, you know social media, but I kind of keep it to the, just the Instagram shit because I don't go on Facebook. I don't want to see what the fuck you're eating. I don't want to hear your politics. I don't want nothing like that. So I keep it on Instagram to to look at the pictures, man. So I keep it simple, and uh, um, you can find me in two spots. If you you know if you see me anywhere else, it's fucking reproducts is fake. I just had, it's funny you say that because I just looked on Amazon to see if you were there and you're not. <laughs> Good. Good. And hopefully I never will be there. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, it needs to be, uh, you know, I, I want you to hunt a little bit. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Because exclusivity is, is, is a good thing. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't do it for their money. I just, uh, I, I, I just want, you know, when people find my stuff, hopefully they, they get excited about it, and they feel like they find something that it's kind of like back in the day when you figure out a, find a new band that you like. Yeah, and you're pumped about it, and you just got their first CD because you heard your friend talk about it. And Remember like, Napster? Fuck yeah! Oh yeah, <laughs> LimeWire, all that shit. Yeah. yeah, it's like when you find a new group, and you're like, fuck yeah, I'm the first one to find this shit. Like I kind of want you to f- figure me out like that. Right. Like oh, I heard this dude on the podcast, and 
checking out his shit. Now I really like it. Right. And I don't I don't want you to be able to get it off Amazon. I don't want you to go on this to see it. Like right. It, you need you need to you need to earn it a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with working for it. Yeah. Well, Anthony, we want to thank you for stopping by. Thank you, man. We appreciate you sitting down with us. I always enjoy smoking with you. Always enjoy seeing you. It's always a treat to see what you're going to drive up in because <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. You never know what yeah. you're going to wheel up in. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been the first podcast of 2024 of the Halligans and Half Wheels podcast from Box 1971. Remember to train hard. We are all that they have.